myself tonight. I'd like to take a moment for us to remember three community members that recently passed away, one being Joe Bosco. Joe and I had differences of opinions, but we all knew we were here for the right reasons. We also had a joke every two years whether either of our names would be on the ballot, and we always said no, and here we were again. The last time we talked about it was in November of 2020. Joe was a great community member, a wonderful businessman, and he will be missed by a lot of people in the town of Enfield. Recently, we lost a firefighter and a Smith bus driver, Wayne Kinney. I didn't have the pleasure to know Wayne, but from what everybody has said, he is a wonderful man and he will be missed. Recently, we also lost Chris Rutledge, a former Board of Ed member. One thing Chris always knew how to do was make me laugh, and he, had, he was genuine when he wanted to know about your personal life and beyond board member business. Take a moment of silence and offer up your thoughts and prayers and condolences for their families. The Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Fire evacuation, there's double doors behind you. Head out the double doors, down the sidewalk to the parking lot. There's double doors to my left, your right. Head out those doors, down the stairs, and again to the parking lot. Roll call, please. Mrs. Acree. Here. Dr. Kalman. Here. Mrs. Cushman. Here. Mr. Hamry. Here. Mr. LeBlanc. Mrs. Pickett. Here. Mr. Ryder. Mr. Ungeyer. Here. Madam Chair. Here. Um, Mr. LeBlanc wanted me to let everyone know he'll be here shortly. He's coaching a baseball game this evening. Board guests. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have several guests tonight. We're going to start with our Enfield High School Community Action Learning students. And I know Mr. Allegro is here, and I am going to make your students introduce themselves because they're probably better, more articulate than I am. So I want to welcome Mr. Allegro and his students, and I will not make any jokes about his mom. <laughs> She's a teacher, um, for those that don't. All right. Is this on? Can you guys hear me? All right. Um, so I'm Mr. Tony Allegro. I teach community action learning class at Enfield High School. And this is Jack Winans, who is in my class and is the president of our community project. And we're here to tell you about our community project that we're doing. So first, I'm going to set Jack up and I'm going to tell uh, you guys how we got to the point of deciding what our community project was going to be. So the nature of the course is very hands-on, uh, student-centered. Uh, student I'm more or less a guide for the students the first quarter. It's a semester class, so there's two marking periods. Um, the first marking period, the students learn the do's and don'ts of community service and how to organize themselves to put on a, a, a good community project. Um, so then they learn things about how to organize themselves like Robert's Rules of Order. And then we design the class like a nonprofit organization. So Jack is the president of the executive board of this class. Um, so then from there, they research uh, different topics, community topics, the needs, and how to make a, a powerful positive impact in the community. And they break into small groups. So there was five, five total projects uh, that they presented. And they have to pitch uh, these projects to judges, myself, uh, and administrators. Um, and then from there, uh, we pick the best uh, community project. So these guys, they learn about finance, um, they learn about fundraising, how to create partnerships, and, and do great things. So Jack is going to tell you about his project, The Kindness Carnival. Hello, everyone. So like Mr. Allegro said, um, I'm Jack Winans. I'm the president of our class project. So our class project is the Kindness Carnival. So what exactly is the Kindness Carnival? The Kindness Carnival, sorry, Carnival is an event at Enfield High where people will get together and have fun and just enjoy each other's time. 
Uh, the Kindness Carnival will have a, 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 a dunk tank, a bounce house, a DJ, uh, carnival style games, and other various activities. Ice cream, snacks, refreshments, and candy will also be provided. Um, Sorry. You're doing great. We decided to do this project to bring more happiness to our community and for people to appreciate each other. Since COVID has made a negative impact on people's social life and their happiness, this project has been designed to make up for the time that we lost. Again, the event will be at Enfield High School at the patio and in the cafeteria, and it will be on, on June 3rd from 5 to 7.30 p.m. Um, the friends of Rachel at e EHS said that they will help us carry out this project along with possibly the student council at the high school. Um, we'd also like to ask PTOs for support and the elementary schools if we could have their support as well. Um, we are right now we are in the process of uh, designing a website for the event and we are making a, a social media campaign to advertise and help get the word out about this event. Uh, we, will, we've, we are doing various uh, fundraisers and working on setting them up to help raise money to help cover the costs for a lot of the activities that we do have. Uh, a certain idea we have is for elementary schools, uh, elementary students to be rewarded for their acts of kindness that they display uh, in the community and in school. Um, and if they are recognized for this act of kindness, they will receive a ticket to come and play the certain games at the event for free. Um, if you do have any questions, please contact uh, Mr. Allegro at aallegro at enfieldschools.org. Uh, he will reach back to you and we we need all the help we can get so if uh, you can help just please email him and we can get you a job <laughs> thank you great job jack so uh we're in the process now the students are reaching out uh there'll be if there are ele any elementary uh teachers in here or um the principals they'll be reaching out and, and shooting off emails uh to try to get them involved and um Mr. Ryder, I saw you just walk in. If you could help us get the word to the PTOs, we'd appreciate that too. Um, so one of the things the students, we really stress with the students in order to put on a good community event, um, bring the community together to help put it on. So they're looking to form partnerships. They'll reach out to, they have a list of emails that they're gonna send out to uh, local businesses and restaurants to see if they wanna be sponsors of our event or if they wanna help us out. Um, so if you know of any other organizations or businesses that would like to, uh, to pitch in, um, it's just going to make the event stronger and the community stronger. So uh, we appreciate your support. And again, uh, to repeat, if, if you guys have any questions, please email me. Um, don't be offended if I don't reply. I'll probably just pass it off to this guy because he's in charge. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Any comments or questions from the board? Mr. Ryder? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to promote that event and thank you for bringing it to our attention. I was actually listening on, on YouTube on the drive-in. Um, I will be happy to pass this on to the PTOs as well as promote it on EnfieldPTO.com through our website, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. So I'll just reach out for any of the materials you have, any flyers once created and we'll get that going. Thank you. Ms. Sakri? I just want to say to Jack, it was nice to hear your voice, Jack. I saw you um, Friday night, uh, once upon a mattress. You did a great job as the mute king. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I just want to say that I think it's great that you're bringing the Kindness Carnival back. I remember when it was at Fermi and when it first started. And I love hearing old names of clubs like Friends of Rachel to know that that's coming back to um, post COVID. Rachel's challenge is amazing. And I love what you're doing because we definitely need more kindness in the world. Um, you fortunately answered all my questions. Um, 
when is it, where is it? Um, and actually, I was going to suggest that Mr. Ryder um, start promoting it to the PTOs. So, um, and I think I appreciate you coming here too to to let the community know that you you need help with it um, because it is a kindness carnival. So we want the community to come together. Um, Congratulations, Jack. Um, I can't wait to, I hope, I think the next time I see you, you might be walking down the hill at Enfield High. <laughs> but thank you um, to you, Jack, and thank you to Mr. Allegro. Um, every year you come up with projects. I know it's been challenging in COVID and I can't wait to see um, how we're going from here. So thank you. Tina, if I could just say something quickly. Sure. Um, I thank you so much, Jack and Mr. Allegro. That was um, brought kindness to my heart just listening to you describe the class um, and how that class functions, but also the project that you've chosen. Um, I Like similar to Tina, I think one of the last in-person events I've attended for MCL Public Schools was a kindness carnival. I have photos of my little ones um, like holding reptiles outside and like doing lots of fun things. So excited to know that June 3rd from 5 to 7.30, we have a date on our calendar. Um, I heard, Jack, you mentioned about partnerships, and I think you're probably in the perfect spot here tonight because um, I know some of our town services and Kite are in the building, which probably could be great partners um, to this event. And you mentioned partnering with the PTO, and your acts of kindness made me think of um, my son attends Enfield Street School, and they're a PBIS school, and they actually earn like warm fuzzies. So I'd love to see a connection, um, like you had mentioned, between the elementary schools participating in this event um, and making that really explicit connection to the expectations at school and what they're already doing um, to promote things of kindness and respect. Um, so thank you so much for what you're doing. Continue the great work, um, and I will be there on the third. Thank you. The next item on the agenda, Enfield Youth Council students. Thank you, Madam Chair. If anyone didn't think our kids are smarter than we are, just look at Jack. He got out of there before you got a chance to ask him questions. <laughs> He's a heck of a lot smarter than the rest of us. Um, but I want to welcome our, our Town of Enfield Youth and Family Service Prevention Coordinator, Bell Sear, and I will give you the opportunity to allow your guests to introduce themselves as well. Um, with several Enfield High School students. So as you can see, they have come well prepared as well. This microphone is, is wonderful. I didn't want to like bend. Anyway, I'm Bell Sear. I'm the prevention coordinator here in Enfield under the Department of Social Service. Sorry. Social Services. And as part of that, I get to work alongside the Enfield Together Coalition and the Enfield Youth Council. And so they're here to present to you today. Introduce yourself. My name is Dylan Lawson, and I'm a senior at Enfield High School, and I'm the Vice President of the Enfield Youth Council. Hi, my name is Angelina Shi, and I'm a freshman at Enfield High School. Hi, I'm Jamie Pereira. I'm a senior, and I'm the President of the Youth Council. Hi, I'm JC Estrada, and I'm a freshman at Enfield High. So first off, we wanted to remind anybody who didn't know or just remember uh, what the Enfield Youth Council really is. So the Enfield Youth Council is connected to the Enfield Together Coalition. We are a youth-led group that work on refining our leadership skills while preventing drug and alcohol use in Enfield. We do this by promoting our messaging on social media through the Enfield Youth Service Show on 1077 WACC at Asnunta Community College and various projects across the community. Today, we're here to present our public service announcement we created for the Connecticut Youth Gambling Prevention Awareness Media Project Showcase. This showcase was hosted in partnership by DMS Problem Gambling Services, the CT Council on Problem Gambling, the Capital Region Re Education Council, and the Regional Behavioral Health Action Organization geared to educate youth on the importance of prevention and warning signs of problem gambling. For this contest, we decided to record an audio-only PSA about gambling components in video gaming. This spread awareness about different gaming, gambling components within video gaming geared towards children. To record the PSA, we worked with Adam Rivers at Asunta Community College. We recorded our portions one by one in the booth. Adam edited the portions together, and we submitted the PSA to the showcase. At the showcase on March 23rd, we learned that we had won best message to the community. 
The Youth Council is recruiting new members for the next school year. You can reach out to Bell Sear if interested. We hope you enjoy our PSA and can answer any questions after it, please. I bet I can get the legendary card first, but each loot box is $5. It'll be worth it. Trust me. One hour later. <sighs> we have to get it at one point. What's going on? We're trying to see who can get the legendary card first. How much money have you spent? You don't even want to know. And how many legendary cards have you gotten? None. But don't worry, we'll get it soon. Don't you see that this is gambling? The truth is, you're addicted to the idea that you could win something valuable. You're wasting your money on something that's not even real, when you could use it on going out with friends, food, or future savings. According to Gamble Aware, of the 93% of children who play video games, up to 40% opened loot boxes, which are randomized chances for rewards to be used during video game play. This gambling aspect within gaming can be addictive. Learn to play responsibly. If if you or someone you know is struggling with a gambling addiction, know that help is available. Call 1-888-789-7777. This PSA was brought to you by the Enfield Youth Council. Any questions, comments? Mr. Hamry? Thank you. Uh, first off, whose voice was that? Was it... At the end? Yeah. That was mine. Nice. Um, <laughs> so uh, having said that, the, um, the, the material is uh, well positioned. You've got a really strong uh, presentation of how to watch for the traps that could lead to the uh, larger issues of problem gambling. Uh, just at the time that the online gambling and sports gambling has come into the state. So um, con congratulations on that. That's excellent. Appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Ryder? I just had a quick question. Is that the same Adam Rivers from KC 101? And, okay. I, I think that's fantastic that he helped you out with that. He actually helped us promote uh, PJ Day for Cancer on December 10th and drove around to all the schools and brought Dunkin' Donuts to our staff. Um, so I, I appreciate him helping you guys out with that, and it sounded amazing. Great job. I just want to congratulate you. I think it's uh, I think it's an important topic, and I think you're starting it right at the right time. Um, and the, you know, making awareness to, to gambling. I've known people who've been um, the victims of virtual gambling and lost uh, you know lost a fortune. It's unfortunate, but um, um, I think um, what you're doing should, is uh, I'm applauding what you're doing. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Pickett. Are you all set? I just want to make sure. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, Ms. Pickett. Um, again, um, super excited to hear students uh, speak about the work that's being done in the community um, and in partnership with the school. Also love that you're highlighting the partnership. So as Nuntuck Community College, um, the partner with the radio station, um, I think we can make so much more effective and efficient work um, when we partner with others. So excited to hear that. Um, I also heard in that, in your uh, opening speech there, that you're looking for new members. So I hope that there's some families watching who encourage um, students to participate. Um, such an awesome way to gain some leadership skills, gain some collaboration skills, make some new friends, and do some great work in our community. Thank you. Um, I would just like to add, thank you so much. Um, what I loved hearing tonight um, from your presentation and your group is that it's a youth-led group, and that's amazing. I love when kids are helping kids or kids are learning to get the awareness out, um, just like uh, the group that Jackson. It's, it's youth-led. You have the adult um, to help you kind of guide your way, maybe help you find some resources, um, but I think it's amazing when kids can help kids. Um, I love that you're working together with the Enfield uh, to go Together Coalition Council as well. Um, I think with all the um, online and gambling that's available now, it's very easy to fall into that. And um, I appreciate you working on this project and coming here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Okay, the next item on our agenda, Amy Morales and Leanne Bolio. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the next guests were totally set up to have to follow those two. Um, <laughs> and I welcome Amy Morales, our Town of Enfield Operations Manager, 
How did your title change? Um, and Leanne Bolio, just all around superstar of everything. And you guys can explain why you're here. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing us to speak um, during this portion of the agenda and give you an update on our school readiness grant. So one of my roles, along with overseeing um, family resource centers and most recently some of the youth and family services work, is to serve as a school readiness liaison. So as just to remind you all, the school readiness grant is a state-funded initiative administered by the Office of Early Childhood. It provides affordable, high-quality early childhood education services for preschool age children um, that helps them prepare for kindergarten. So at least 60% of the children enrolled must be at or below 75% of the state medium income. And by legislation, school readiness providers have to meet certain quality components. They have to be accredited by NIAC. They, their staff are required to meet the staffing requirements for state-funded programs, which includes having teachers who are working towards their bachelor's degree, family engagement and integrating children with disabilities um, into the program is an important part of the quality components. The grant also provides quality enhancement funding, which can be used to provide professional development to staff of the program. So Enfield has been receiving funding for 28 school readiness slots since 1998. And since then, all slots, all of these 28 slots have been housed at the Enfield Child Development Center, which is located in Stowe, as you know. And the location of, of ECDC in the Stowe Early Learning Center is another example of the wonderful collaborations and partnerships that take place between our town and Board of Education programs. So. Um, between the staff of all programs sharing professional development, between families and staff participating in the family educator organization, there are so many ways that partnerships take place in the, those programs. We've also formed a subcommittee of parents who are part of the school readiness program to make sure that their voice and input um, is heard and that they have a seat at the table at our school readiness council, which is KITE. So I'm going to turn it over to Leanne to tell you about the connection between KITE and our council. Good evening. I'm Leanne Bolio, and I am currently serving as the chairperson for KITE um, and also the chairperson for the School Readiness Council. Um, and in Enfield, historically, KITE and the School Readiness Council have become one entity. Um, it you know, when you look at the makeup of the School Readiness Council and the types of people that we want involved in kind of engaging with early childhood education, clearly they mirrored those people that we wanted as part of an overall early childhood collaborative. And so um, the state has allowed us to combine those two councils into one. And so I serve as the chair of that. In that capacity, we oversee the grant um, for school readiness. Um, Amy reports biweekly to our leadership work group and monthly to the membership of the, the whole membership of the collaborative. Um, during the grant renewal process, so that happens every two years, we don't have to go through this every year, every two years, um, the role of KITE is to actually facilitate and to work with Amy um, in terms of the implementation of the procedures of the grant. Um, at our May meeting, which is happening next week, I'm going to be bringing um, a recommendation to the collaborative um, to um, to award the 28 school readiness slots to the Enfield Child Development Center. Um, I think that one of the things that we are most um, appreciative of in KITE and the School Readiness Council is, as Amy said, the collaboration that occurs in such an incredibly unique way among KITE, um, the agencies that um, support early childhood, the school district, and the town. Um, there are very few communities where you will have one building housing three different programs and meeting together and collaborating together. And I will, as an aside, say to you that I have done some work in terms of um, supporting and coaching teachers um, at Stowe in all three of the programs. And the um, leaders, the directors, the educational directors of those programs, as well as the school administration, has fostered that so that there is a continuity and a consistency of values and goals and programs and approaches to education that 
help our children transition from preschool into kindergarten. Um, and that is incredibly unique. Um, I've, I've been in education for a long time, and it is a very unique and something we, we all need to be proud of. So I can only imagine the innumerable hours that all of you spend um, as Board of Education members, and I would urge you when you need to re-energize to visit Kite, I mean to visit, well, Kite, whose offices are in, in the, in at Stowe, but to visit Stowe, um, to see firsthand, really, um, in, in person and in action, the high expectations that the Office of Early Childhood um, impose on our program, um, and see how those things have crossed over into the Head Start program, the STEAM program, and the Integrated Preschool program, and vice versa. So there is really an incredibly rich community of young learners um, that are starting there. And I will say to you one last thing that, um, that Stowe's importance is only magnified now when we are hearing so much about the mental health issues that young children are facing. Um, and having staffs that are prepared to nurture those children, guide them, and, and even more importantly, understand um, and, and accept um, the issues that they face and be willing to help address them in school is, is just so essential and beautiful to see. I just want to add one more thing. So this year we did submit a, um, we had to submit a public notice, a request for proposal um, to the community for any eligible interested providers that wanted to attend. We did only receive the one application, which was Enfield Child Development Centers. We had a review committee um, that met last week to review and score their application, and they recommended it for funding. So we'll be voting on that, as Leanne said, at the May kite meeting. Any questions or comments? Dr. Jerry? Yeah, I just wanted to take this opportunity to congratulate both of you for the incredible work that's going on at Stowe and at Kite. Um, I, I agree with you, Leanne. The, the, the key to success uh, of our early childhood program has been collaboration, that there's a, a, an approach to early childhood health and welfare that is s seamless and orderly, and you don't see that very often. I mean, even at the state level, I, I serve on the board of the Connecticut Association for Infant Mental Health, and you see all these government agencies and organizations just working at cross purposes with one another, and it, it becomes completely chaotic. And what you've done in Enfield is just the opposite of that, just producing this very orderly, very rational, seamless approach to early childhood uh, care. And, and I'm glad, you know, it, I'm glad that the collaboration focuses on early childhood because um, uh, early childhood health and wellness, especially mental health, is foundational for everything else. And uh, it, it's critically important that we nurture our children right out the gate uh, rather than sitting on problems and waiting for them to explode before we finally decide to do something. And I think it's exactly what uh, the Stowe Early, Le Le Stowe Early Learning Center is really all about, just proactively supporting children um, so that they grow up in a healthy, nurturing environment. So thank you very much. Ms. Pickett? Um, I think I could cry listening to um, Leanne and Amy because when you speak of what happens at so I've experienced that for four, four years um, with my family. And actually today, as I was picking up my son from school, um, I was reflecting that this is my last year at so and I'm really sad about that. Um, but hopefully I'll be able to continue partnering with so because it's such an amazing place. Um, and I do just want to reiterate, Lee, and your point that So Early Learning Center really is a premier early learning center um, for the state. What we have done there as far as combining programs, uh, town partnerships, public school partnerships, um, and the high quality care that's happening there, um, innovative child care, so many amazing things. Um, and both of you are leaders in that work, but I also have to shout out Jackie Valley, who I think um, couldn't be a more kind administrator and the appropriate person leading those efforts. Um, but I do have one question. So you mentioned the 28 slots. 
Um, I was somewhat hoping with some additional funds coming to the statewide state, we would get more seats. Um, is there space for more capacity? Is there a need for more capacity? And is there any potential to get more funding for more slots? As of right now, the Office of Early Childhood released what each community is getting, and it is still the same the, enough for the 28 full day year round slots. Are we were, we hope, we were hoping for, so I know that other school readiness programs have been advocating for more funding for that, um, and we were hoping, um, I know the budget hasn't passed yet, but. So we, is, is there space for more at so, and is there need for more? Like, are we having families who could utilize the program, but unfortunately we don't have enough seats? Um, the 28 slots make up the three preschool classrooms at and field child development center, so we would need more um, more classrooms for more if we were to take more slots. Perfect. Thank you so much for the work that you um, both do, and everybody who um, interacts with all of the programs within. So, um, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Hamry. Uh, Amy, you'd mentioned that uh, there was one group that uh, did apply for a portion. Of, I I didn't catch the phrasing exactly. I apologize, but. Um, is that typical, or do you usually get more applicants? It's, it's been typical. It's been our experience. I think one year we did get another applicant, but because the requirements um, are so high that the programs have to be accredited, they have their staff have to meet these requirements, it, it's difficult for some early childhood programs to meet those, so they're not eligible to apply. So it has historically only been Enfield Child Development Center that has applied. But if and another program did apply, we would review their application as well. We would have to vote on where we would put those slots. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. We actually, just so that you know, we actually, there was a year that we did have more than one. And what we do is we, um, as Kite, we redact. So when 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 the review committee looks over the two, uh, looked over the two applications, we redacted the names of both programs. So they did not know which programs they were, you know, the committee um was doing and we do not vote so it's just Amy and I do not vote they the, it's the committee that does that um, and understand that you know some of the requirements have to do with the education of the personnel um, so there's you know there and again very strict um, requirements around that which which also then leads to um, you know budget oh absolutely well. and uh, is there I, I I'm glad to hear that there's such a high bar and that it's um uh, it, it's not wavering. Is is there a uh, a need for other other groups to step up and and open up to more opportunities? Is, if I'm phrasing that right, I'm not quite sure I am. But uh, do we need more competition in that, or or more to be approved? No. Yes. I and I, if the question doesn't make sense, it's on me. I apologize. No, no, no. It does. It it, it does. I'm just. I'm. I'm. I think the hard thing for me in terms of answering is that um, ECDC has done such an exceptional job that in terms of the need for competition, um, I'm not sure how to I'm not sure how to answer that. I, I think what I would wish would be that we would get more money and that there wouldn't need to be a competition, but that we could fund lots of different programs. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate this it. Funding is, this funding, it, it helps families afford it. So if there's sliding fees, it's based on income. Um, so uh, It is entirely my misunderstanding. I apologize. I appreciate the uh, Thank clarifications. Thank you. Thank you. Just quickly, um, Ms. Bolio? Yes. Yes. I want to first thank you for the invite to visit the Child Development Center in Stowe. Um, I gladly accept that invite. I'd like to work with the administration and certainly like to learn more about what goes on there. I'm very encouraged to hear that you're looking after the mental health of our, our youngest students. We tend to think that um, mental health issues tend to manifest later on, perhaps a little later on in life, but um, many students come from the same environment when they're very small as they, when they get older. So. Um, I'm sure that you're able to identify um, those things that uh, need addressing. And so I'm very encouraged to hear that, that, that you're looking after that at the youngest age. I'd certainly like to learn more about what you do. And um, so thank you for the invite. And I'll follow up with you. So I'll end with um, 
congratulations on your new role uh, with the town of Enfield. <laughs> uh, but I would also like to say um, there's actually four former um, Board of Ed members here. And I can't remember where everybody was when these discussions started. But if you were here, I think it way surpassed um, the expectations that was set out about creating that you know, early learning center. Um, it grows every year and the staff is extremely dedicated, but what's most important is it's definitely helpful with the community as a whole. And you seem to focus on issues um, that are high and focus on that and put your resources there. Um, I think that um, this, I like Mr. Ungeyer will plan to visit. I'll be setting up a visit to do that. And um, I appreciate everything you do for that. And um, I can't wait to hear what's next because there is always something next. <laughs> so. Thank you. Oh, play lab, yes. Thank you. We're, we're hoping to reopen the play lab, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you so much. Superintendent's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll do the quick items first. Um, first off, kind of going out of order, uh, tomorrow, April 27th, is an early release day for students with lunch, uh, so our staff members can uh, engage in professional development opportunities. And also, that's not on the agenda this evening, but I wanted to provide an update for the board. Um, as you know, you have a uh, public hearing tomorrow on the budget with the town council. Um, and also, as you are aware, on the budget that you passed, there was a there was sort of a directive and something that we've done, you know, consistently over the last number of years um, is when the board uh, submits their budget proposal to the council, there's that caveat, there's a lot of things that we don't know. Um, and it's sort of a direct direction to me and the town manager to work together to see if there's any available adjustments to that number to make people aware. And I had, a, had an opportunity to speak with the town manager yesterday and we've identified through some unexpected retirements and some changes in our insurance that um, there's about a half a million dollars worth of savings, if you want to look at it that way, um, that can be reflected in the board's request. Um, but I didn't want anyone to hear about that and think we were cut. Um, and I want to make very clear that if our, our budget was reduced by that amount, it would have zero impact on programs um, or personnel as we had discussed during our budget presentation. So the manager and I worked very closely throughout. We said this in the beginning, this is a sort of a year long process. Uh, we've identified on our side some reductions in, in, in expenditures for next year um, that I shared with the manager as, as she's putting together the town wide budget and I wanted to be fair to the, to the board. Um, and I think there's some council members in the room that may not know this yet either, but we are working and we're trying. Um, but that is something that is possible and I want to make sure in, in this forum that anyone hearing it might not misinterpret that as being a reduction in NAR staffing and programs. That's not the case. But that, as it is every year, we do our budget in January and we don't have a lot of answers in January and we're starting to get a clearer picture on, on what next year could look like at this point. Uh, and lastly, um, I, I wasn't planning necessarily on addressing this at this point, however, um, I, I think given recent conversations, I, I, I must. And first, as, as I explained to all of you, and as well as the town council, um, we are not currently an alliance district. Okay, I felt I had an obligation to inform you as the board and, and the town council that it was a possibility, especially since we are in the midst of budget deliberations and a designation like this could have a financial implication for the board and the town. And as I shared with you and the town council and even a reporter, um, I'm not comfortable going into too many details about this possible designation until I receive the official notification from the commissioner's office, which at this moment I have not received. If or when I do receive official notification, I have every intention on presenting to the board and the public a more detailed explanation of what that actually means. However, since this has become a topic of public discourse, I feel it's necessary to clarify some facts about the process for the members of the board and the, and the community that's watching. Um, what I shared originally was that I was verbally told that we could become an alliance district. And here's how. The process of des designating a district as an alliance district is a reevaluation process that happens every five years and the state only permits 33 districts into this network. And if I'm being honest, we expected to be named five years ago. However, none of the ex existing districts of that 33 were graduated out. Therefore, Enfield wasn't welcomed in. 
Uh, during my verbal conversations with the state, I was told that within the governor's proposed budget, that three current districts were being recommended to graduate out, and therefore three new districts could be added, added to it. If the governor's budget is approved, we would be a district that qualifies to be added. But until this process is complete, this is all speculative. And with the budget in Enfield looming, I felt it was the responsible thing to do to at least notify you as the board and the council that this was a possibility, as there could be ramifications townwide if this designation does come to fruition. If we are designated, there are several factors that make us eligible. Yes, test scores are a factor. And, and by no means am I trying to run from that, as some have suggested. But test scores alone do not tell the entire story. Alliance districts are defined by the 33 lowest performing districts in the state. But as board members, you are aware from documentation that I sent you that Alliance districts are further defined by the 33 neediest districts in the state. We can't ignore facts just because they don't fit a particular narrative. But what does that mean? Quite simply, our kids and our families have needs. And how do we know that? I'm gonna ask, and I can't help but notice Mr. Neville staring back at me and having deja vu, so I'm gonna pick on his side of the room. Um, but I'm gonna ask everyone to the left of the aisle, and I promise I won't pick on you, but can you guys just raise your hands for me? Really, I'm not gonna pick on you, but just raise your hands for me. Alex, if it's possible, can you spin the camera to the audience? I don't know if he did or not, but if those folks are home or watching, but if, if this room, is a microcosm of our town, then every person with their hand up right now represents one of our students who qualifies for free and reduced lunch. Alex, you could put the slide on the board now, please. As you can see, our free and reduced lunch numbers are currently at 48.6%. Now this is the most you can put your hands down, sorry. Um, this is the most up-to-date information that I have. As the past two years, this has actually been waived because of the pandemic. So every student in town is eligible for free lunch if they want it. So the most up-to-date figures that we have publicly are 2019, 2020. Um, but the last number I have on record shows that one out of every two kids in our town is at or below the poverty level. This is not an excuse. These are just facts. And as you can see, I've gone back 15 years, and the reality is that our number has almost doubled during that time frame. And the facts are our community has changed, and so have the needs of our students. And just as much as test scores, this figure plays a greater role in the possibility of a designation as an alliance district than anything else. I know Mr. LeBlanc's not here, but I wish he was because I had a question for him because he always has a question for me every, every two weeks. But you guys all are aware by his absence tonight that he's a baseball coach. So those of you who are somewhat familiar with coaching youth sports, you can think of this in your own heads. You know, if Jonathan had a player and he had a big game on Saturday at 8 o'clock in the morning and his best player hadn't eaten lunch since Friday the day before, probably one that we fed that student, you think that kid's gonna play their best? Of course not, that's not a controversial statement. But the question is then, what makes a ball game different than a math test? Do we think that our kids should perform at a high level when they have so many other outstanding needs? Again, it's not a realistic expectation. And I'm not saying this to place blame on anyone. I'm actually taking responsibility for this. We owe it to our kids to give them what they need not what special interests think they need, which is why we've already taken steps and actions to give our kids what they need and what they deserve. I also think we owe it to the public and our kids an explanation to inform them that every student's situation is not the same. You know, I saw an old friend recently who years ago used to have this intellectual curiosity in how many languages we spoke in the district. And when I ran into him, this time I actually asked him the question. And his response, and he hadn't been gone that long, but his response to me was four. 
The real answer is 14. And by next year, it'll be beyond 14. It'll probably be more like 16. We speak 14 different languages in this community. That's a good thing. But what this means is that we have some kids that start with us without speaking a word of English. And just like every other kid, there is an expectation that they will not only speak English proficiently, but that they will also test proficiently within one year of coming here. Think about that. We have students who move here from another country, not another state, not Jersey, another country, have never spoken English before in their life. And we expect them in one year to not only learn a new language, but to be proficient in, that, in the same subjects of a student who has spent their entire life living in Misty Meadow. Do you think that will have an impact on test scores? If you don't, I don't think I can ever change your mind, and that's okay. But my point is here is there's been a lot of discussions about this, most with a negative connotation surrounding it, and that just shouldn't be. Our diversity is our strength, and every student in their family brings something to this community that makes it the special place that it is. Our kids come from different backgrounds and have different needs, and we have a responsibility to provide them the needs so they can succeed no matter what the public discourse is. Now listen, I also hear a lot from people saying that there needs to be excuse me, more responsibility in the home. I'm not arguing that point, but we can't forget that every student's home doesn't look the same. Maybe we were all lucky enough to have two parents at home, but today our kids are facing a much different reality. Some of our kids are being raised in a single parent household some by grandparents, aunts, uncles, or even siblings. Some are being raised by parents that don't speak English at all in their home. And some kids, if they're lucky, and I emphasize the word lucky, are being raised by two parents. But their parents could be two moms or two dads, and that's wonderful. Whatever our kids' home structure is, we must recognize that this is what makes all of us and our community special. Enfield is a big, diverse, caring, and beautiful community. And our diversity, whatever your definition is, is what makes it this way. A few months ago, I introduced a new position to the district, Director of Educational Equity. And I was hopeful that I'd be able to formally introduce Ms. Cox Blackwell by now, but circumstances have distracted us. But it's time we get back to work. And though there were some that were not shy about sharing their opposition to it, I want to remind the nine members of the board what I shared with you when I informed you of this great new addition. Now, some immediately thought of only racial equity. And although that's a big part of it, I have to remind you again that equity in our terms is a much broader definition. Race, gender equity, sexual orientation, culture, language, disability, and yes, social economic status are all matters of equity that we need to prioritize to give our kids what they deserve. Alliance designation or not, structural changes to the district to address equity for our kids is already underway because we owe it to each of them to give them what they need. And let me finally address the last bit of information that's been floating out there. Excuse me, money. Now, we've had some heated discussions in this very room regarding the state of Connecticut. So I ask this question to everyone. Does anyone here really think that the state is going to give us more money because we already have enough, but we just don't spend it correctly? If you believe that, again, that's OK, but I'm not going to change your mind. The reality is you become an alliance district because your needs don't meet your resources. Simply put, you're short money. And if you follow the calculation, which is out in public for anyone to see, the state takes your ECS grant from 10 years ago and compares it to your current year, and that delta becomes your alliance grant. So in our case, it could be, again, we're not in yet, about $1.5 million, give or take. Now, this $1.5 million will still be distributed in the form of an ECS payment. 
And the difference is that that funding will no longer go, no longer go directly to the town. It can only be accessed by the Board of Education. So I'll ask again, does anyone think that the state is going to potentially give us $1.5 million that only we can touch and the town can't because we have too much money and they just want to help? Fact is, the answer is no. <laughs> and the truth is, we're about a million and a half short where our spending is supposed to be compared to what our needs are designated by the state of Connecticut. Now, every year, except this one, coincidentally, I include in my budget presentation our per pupil expenditures compared to similar districts, how much we spend on each student, and we compare that to similar districts. I didn't do that this year because of the grant situation, as you all know. But every year we get applauded because our per pupil expenditure is much lower than everybody else. And the truth is, eventually that's going to catch up to you because as our needs grow, so do our needs for additional resources. There's also this revelation that now we're finally going to be held accountable with the state. Some of you and some of our staff members in this room are freaking out because of this. I'm not. I'm not because... We already are. Every year, we have to certify with the state of Connecticut where every nickel of our $72 million go. And if that's not enough, we also have something called an audit, which, by the way, the nine of you don't control. The town council actually controls that. But that tracks our expenditures to ensure the money we have is being spent the way it was intended. If there were any improprieties, does anyone think the state or our auditors would not only find it, but they wouldn't report it. In case you're wondering, as board members, some of you are new, you all get the audit report. Your own finance committee reviews expenses every month, and none of this is new. And I'm not pinning this on Mayor Bob. I mean, this is like this summer, like every other summer, we're going to have a team of auditors that comb through our books looking for potential issues. And they'll report back to the town, and they'll report back to the town council, and you guys will get a copy of that report too. So if any elected official believes we're not spending money appropriately, pull out your audit books. I'm not trying to cause trouble. I just need to, I feel the need to set the record straight with, with certain facts, particularly since this has come up. So yes, it is possible that we may become an Alliance district. Yes, our scores are not where we would like them. That shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone who sat on this board the last few years. But, and this is a term we heard recently, and I, I won't credit anybody with it, but if you want to do a root cause analysis, this is pretty simple. The needs of our kids have changed, and we need to change too. However, this is not something that I will ever let be turned into a negative talking point for someone on social media or even the press, because all of us owe our kids that, and show our kids that we're better than that. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Drezek. Audiences, I'd just like to announce that everybody should sign up um, to, to speak tonight. Okay. Um, if you, you can sign up as the audience members are going, but I'm not going to call anybody up from the audience. I'm not going to say, is there anybody else that would like to speak? Yeah, no, that's fine. I just want to let everybody know if it's your intent to speak, you should sign up. As always, I'm going to talk about what it, the audience entails. Um, and I know a lot of you are tired of hearing it <laughs> because I say it every week, but just in case there's any new speakers. Um, you must be an Enfield resident to participate in the audience portion of the meeting. We ask that you state your name and address. Board members cannot respond back to you during this portion of the meeting, but the board members can respond during their board member comments if they choose to do so. We also cannot respond to student or personnel matters. We strongly ask that you refrain from personalities. We strongly ask that you refrain from yelling out during audiences or board members during their comments. Tonight... Kathy, how many more names do we have up there? I'm on six. Oh, six, sorry. I'm going to have to stick with three minutes tonight due to the fact that we have a full agenda with approvals and um, different things that we have to address tonight and vote on. 
Okay, the first name, Chrissy Aslan. Christine Aslan, 261 Pearl Street. It's red, is it? Oh, me too. <laughs> we both have to make sure the microphone's on. Oh, yep, it's on. Good. Sorry, Chrissy, can you state your name again? Yep, Christine Aslan, 261 Pearl Street. As a parent with three kids who have all been in the public school system, I have always been involved in my kids' assignments. I have a child who graduated last year with high honors every quarter from seventh grade until he graduated, as well as amazing test scores through high school. My younger child is struggling with tests and grades, yet the same teachers are teaching the same stuff that my older son learned. So while the teachers are doing their job of teaching, my child is not doing his job of learning. He's being lazy and his work with his work and not paying attention. That is a my child and I issue, and one I can guarantee is happening with other teenagers and their parents. So while yes, test scores are down, it is time for some of us parents to take accountability and hold our kids accountable and expect more. Stop blaming the, te the teachers and schools for something that is a failure on us parents and our kids just as much as the schools. I am having a hard time understanding how it is justified that people have made a sex ed assignment issue so known that it has possibly opened the door for real pedophiles from all over to search us up and join in on our conversations of sex ed and our children. People who have no children at all are trying to join in our parent groups to start conversations about our kids and sex ed. They try to justify it with the response of, I care about the curriculum and what happens in the schools. Yet when asked their thoughts on curriculum for English, history, or any other subject, subject for eighth grade being taught this year, they have no idea what is being taught. So as a parent, my concern is why have some taken a sudden obsessive interest in sex ed related issues with our kids? The emails that I have recently read added that much more concern to what has been going on lately. Board members following directions of our residents step by step about how to exploit people in our schools for their own political gain at the expense of others and our children. Janet, John, and Jean, you have now aligned yourself with this person who wants to exploit our school issues, and your reply to this is brilliant. The person you have aligned yourself with is the same person who makes a comparison to a political post that turned into a woman defending herself, while others stated she asked for it. Your partner's statement was, imagine yourself going into a ghetto in downtown Springfield screaming, N-I-G-G, hashtag, hashtag, R-S suck. What do you think would happen? The first and only comparison that could be thought of was a disgusting racist comment. This is who are you are taking orders from. Some of you have incorporated encourage these people to exploit this issue, leading to threatening phone calls and emails. By exploiting this, any action could have been taken by someone showing up to hurt our teachers and kids. Because of these concerns, some of us parents now have to decide if we will pull our kids out of public school because our Board of Education, who is supposed to pr protect our kids, are so focused on their own religious beliefs and politics that they are exploiting people and issues at the risk of getting our children hurt, spending money and time seeking legal help to protect our children from our own board of ed. You're exploiting people while using the excuse God led you to do this and you should be ashamed. I'm very concerned by the emails I, and I strongly believe some of you members are a danger to my kids and others. Your time's up. Thank you, Ms. Aslan. Tim Neville. I didn't sign up, folks. He said he wanted to. <laughs> Ray Peabody. <sighs> Been a while. Ray Peabody, 370 Washington Road, our fair town. I really didn't want to come tonight, but I felt the need that I had to. Um, the talk about Alliance District, I'm not going to repeat what Mr. Dresick said, but I am going to let you guys know some facts. I'm going to ask you some questions I want you to think about. Did you know the 2020 graduation rate for Enfield Public Schools was 92.1%, state target of 88.5%. 2019, the same rate for Enfield was 87.8%. State was 88.5. 2018, our rate was 89.6, and the state was 88.3. 
Three years, we topped the state average. That's pretty damn good in my book. As far as SAT goes, which is something I follow, it, our English language arts was 508. State was 514, and these are averages. Math was 499 for Enfield, and the state was 500. Those are averages. That means we had a higher number of people that exceeded the state average than those who did not. Um, our English as a second language students is 2.6% of our student population. And as Mr. Dresick said, it's gone. We're going to have 14 different individual languages. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever dealt with foreign or offshore type people, but when they talk to you they, and you ask them a question or they solve a problem, they think in their native tongue and then, or the native language, and then translate to English. So it's a higher intellectual uh, capacity that's being executed. However, when you don't know the language that well and you're taking a test and you don't have an interpreter and you're expected to be at grade level within one year or actually nine months of the school year, you're hosed. And our town is hosed because then we get rated lower than we should. The other um, cohort and when we, we, we look at our academics is special education students. And this is what I learned when I was on the board. Our special ed students are expected to perform these tests at grade level. And what I asked for, and it was something that was very controversial and we couldn't do it because of privacy rules, is figure out how to break out the test scores between our mainstream students, our ESL students, and our special ed students. It does two things for us. One, it shows our mainstream students are performing at whatever they're going to perform. Two, for our English as a second language students, they get a better shot. We can provide them with translators, maybe if budget allows, but it shows us what they're doing actually and what adjustments need to be made. And for our special ed kids, we can sit there and figure out what resources we need to give these kids so they can perform uh, when, they graduate, when they leave our Enfield schools. Um, the one that bothers me the most is the uh, free and reduced lunch statistic. Now, I asked a couple board members if they knew what that percentage was. And they did not know it's at 48.6%. I was at, thought it was 49. Um, Mr. Peabody, unfortunately, your time's up. Yeah, I kind of figured that. <laughs> but I got some great stuff here. <laughs> but thank, I want, the main thing was to get the alliance, and I appreciate what you guys do. And the last comment I'm going to make is in line with the young lady that was before me. Do not let evangelize, um, do not evangelize our kids. That's what church is for. Church schools for learning and setting these kids up for later on in life. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pivotal. <laughs> Rob Anderson. I have some handouts for you here. Good. Thank you. Uh, Rob Anderson, 34 Bass Drive. So, yeah, I'm still on the pizza and consent issue. I gave you all a handout just so you can help to remember the questions I'm asking. So, number one, how did the assignment get into the curriculum? Who added it? Who makes the lesson plan that the teacher delivers to the students? Was this an opt-out assignment or an opt-in assignment as someone had reported? We've been told that the assignment was not supposed to be about sex and an alternate page two should have been given out. Where's the other version? There's no other version found anywhere. There's no second page that's been provided Nothing. The first page speaks about sex and consent. So if, if the first page talks about sex and consent, but the assignment's not supposed to be about sex and consent with a different second page, how does that work? 
What age was the version that was given out designed for? Is there an appropriate grade that that should have been given out? Should have given out to seniors? I, I still don't think it's appropriate. We're hearing that some of the classes that were taught were taught by a special guest. Who was this special guest that came in and why couldn't the teacher teach it? Was the assignment given out electronically on an iPad? We already know the answer. It was given out on an iPad. Because of that, the student's answers are then going to be in a database. Who has access to that database? Do teachers have it? Just that one teacher? Anybody in the school? Are there places outside of the school system that have access to it? Is that information shared with groups or companies? What procedures have changed to prevent this from happening again? Now, I understand you said you have procedures in place, but that didn't work. So has anything changed since then? This question is for Mr. Hamring. You've repeatedly said it, that this didn't happen. Then you stated, well, it did happen, but you're going to stand behind everything that you had already said, which was basically saying that it didn't happen. So it's a little confusing. Mr. Berrios and Mr. Dresick, you've both actively chosen not to reply. Not really sure why that is. Mr. Anderson, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Colleen O'Callaghan. How are you doing? Colleen O'Callaghan, 10 Midway Street. So some information came to light uh, through a friend. Um, she's 25 and she has a sibling that is in eighth grade. And the first week of their health class, the sibling came home with the pizza assignment and had told my friend how uncomfortable she was. And the reason that it was uncomfortable is because apparently they were paired up in class to do this assignment. And this person, this sibling, got to be with their friend. So it wasn't as bad, but it was still uncomfortable. There was apparently another list that is not either of those sheets um, that we've all seen. Um, and there was a couple items on there that were probably like, you know, holding hands or something not very explicit, but the rest of them as what I've been told were explicit. I'm asking my friend to write this up so I can, you know, get it to you in, an, in a formal way. Um, but my friend said that she found it um, shocking that when her father found out, he also was very upset um, and that it was heard in the class that the teacher was encouraging students to put more toppings on the pizza, which I find beyond ridiculous. So it's more than just um, the fact that somebody actually thought this assignment up, designed it on the computer, that it was seen by a teacher who is supposed to know better what is moral and not and hands it out to students, or I guess gets it by iPad, but that they were even paired up. And I, I would say what is more upsetting is I remember doing assignments with other kids in class when I was in school, and you didn't always get to get paired up with your friend if your friend wasn't even in your class. So what students were paired up with whom, and were they comfortable to even talk about this and then being kind of made to talk about this with other kids that they might not even 
like or feel anywhere comfortable with this situation. So I find it very disturbing that, you know, we we all thought it was one thing. Maybe you guys already knew. I certainly didn't. So I was blown away when I heard this. Um, the fact that people are saying, oh, it didn't happen or this wasn't meant or this wasn't meant. It doesn't matter what was meant. It was the fact that it it was actually much more of an assignment than I've heard about. And I think it is it's awful that this even happened. But what other assignments are there that we won't know about until the children already come home and tell us what they've been exposed to? Anyway, thank you. Ryan Schutz. Thank you for your email. Oh, thanks. There was just a bigger agenda tonight, but I do take that into consideration. So I appreciate you reaching out to me. Ryan Schutz, 106 Church Street. Good evening. Parents and kids need action taking place on how to prevent these inappropriate assignments from happening again. We cannot just take your word this will never happen again. Here are some examples as to why. Second graders in a Greenwich school were shown a cartoon movie not meant for the classroom. Won't go into details, but go look for yourself what was shown to second graders. The name is Alfred and Shadow, a short story about emotions. Missouri students given a math assignment about Maya Angelou's sexual abuse. One example of a question on the assignment is, trying to support her son as a single mother, she worked as a pimp, prostitute, blank, with a multiple choice of A, bookie, B, drug dealer, or C, nightclub dancer. How does the language in these assignments better any children? I'll answer that. They don't. We shouldn't have anything remotely close to these assignments in the schools. This is exactly why we need extra eyes on what's coming into our children's schools. This is not only statewide, it's a nationwide issue that shouldn't be ignored. I'm not, nor have I ever been after the teachers. I just want answers and haven't got any. There is a group of people that have misconstrued and twisted words to fit their narrative. I get six minutes a month to speak on topics to better my child and her education. I've always tried to not give any energy to that, but at this time I find it important. I hear people say they want to get back to business at the Board of Ed like we're hindering that. So far everything that has been brought up on my behalf, the main focus is, has always been about the kids. I don't know if people don't listen or hear what I'm actually saying, but it seems like their objective is trying, trying to slander or discredit my words. All I want is positive change for all of the community. I don't see how people don't see this. There can be a committee set up for bullying or mental health committee, maybe even a spinoff to give high school kids who are homosexual or anyone who may feel singled out in any way a special group to get together for more than 20 minutes a month. Month. With parents and teachers, there's so many positives that can come out of this committee for the kids and the community. It's a shame this could possibly be spun into something it isn't. This is and should be focused on the children. Let's actually be about your mission statements. How would adding a committee to filter the curriculum as an extra set of eyes or a parent-teacher committee to come up with new ideas to help against bullying can be perceived as negative is beyond me. United we stand, divided we fall and we are falling. Quit pointing fingers, let's get something actually accomplished for the kids. And seeing as I still have three minutes or some time, if these foreign kids come in, why set the bar so high? Instead of making the whole district suffer, why not set different standards for them? Thank you. Ryan Moore. Good evening. Ryan Moore, 155 Raffi Road. So, Mr. Yeah. Moore, I know why you're saying that. What? That's not your address, sir. Yeah, I just thought I'd use the school address. That's not your address. Uh, state your name and address for the record, please. Ryan Moore, 10 Ryefield Drive. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. You're welcome. So, you know, usually I have some prepared remarks, um, but I'm not sure anything 
anybody says really gets heard up here. So um, last time I said that, you know, I didn't expect this experience coming here. I thought this is my community. These are community members. I'm going to present some ideas. You may not like them, but, you know, we'll have a back and forth. We'll talk and something good will come of it. It's probably naive. Um, as soon as, you know, we came here, there was a target on my back personally. There's, there's people that obviously come here and it's like I came in and peed on the rug. But I think, uh, I think there's, there's an email that kind of shed some light on what's happening and why. Dear colleagues, last time I called for action, our members came out and represented the ETA wonderfully. Mr. Dresick was overwhelmed with the support we showed him. Last time we filled an entire side of council chambers with our staff. It was simply amazing. Unfortunately, I need to call action again. This time I hope we can fill council chambers. The town manager just lifted the mask mandate. The people who have recently attended these meetings in person haven't been kind to our BOE members, Chris or Andy. Some attendants have threatened, sworn at, and are simply making untrue statements at our BOE and central office. Now that the mask mandate is lifted, the BOE meetings will be held in person again. The rhetoric is being turned against our teachers. We've been called pedophiles. Some of these individuals are claiming that we are grooming students. Tina acknowledged last time we showed up, the whole tone of the meeting changed. Why do we show up every day? We do it for the kids of Enfield. We finally have a town council and BOE not only listen, willing to listen to us, but to take action on what we, the teachers of Enfield, feel is in the best interest of our kids. I'm sorry to ask one more thing of you. However, these we got these individuals elected. We want them in these seats working with us, and they are asking for our help. So please, if you can, come to the town hall at 6 p.m. Tuesday. I plan to wear all black to support the CAA blackout. Invite your families and friends. Let's fill the seats and show the BOE we stand with them for our children. You do not need to speak. However, if you feel compelled to do so, you must be a resident of Enfield. We have had non-residents speak using the school address before. Feel free to email me if you need ideas, and I'd be happy to share some. <coughs> Who's making this town divisive? Who's telling the teachers? I hope some of the teachers watch our comments. I've never said a bad word about a teacher. I've never seen a parent come up here and say teachers are the problem. Yet someone's going to the teachers and telling them we're calling them pedophiles. Who's causing the division here? This is a sham and a shame. I hope you still have a chance, and I hope. There's, there's never uh, too late a time to change direction. There's no reason for this. You can still change directions. I hope you will. And I just want to say real quick, I missed my son's baseball game. He got his first hit of the season. Go, Declan, you're awesome. Congrats. Jonathan Grande. Good evening. Thank you for offering the time for us. Um, want to speak Your name and address, oh. and then I'll start the timer after you give that. Thank you. Jonathan Grande, Spruce and Road, Enfield. Um, some politically motivated individuals in our community sorted through thousands of emails obtained through a FOIA request, and Cherry picked one. Let me repeat one out of thousands, and they attempted to paint a picture that that one email represented all 4,000. They then chose to weaponize that one single email written months ago. They reached out to our local paper and had a misleading story written in an attempt to further their narrative. What is their narrative? Simple. They want to deflect from the real issue and only issue at hand. And that issue is the pizza and consent assignment that was distributed to our kids. The BOE majority and superintendent have demonstrated absolutely no tangible action that has been taken nor described to the taxpaying public or the parents or the teachers or anybody else in the town to get to the root cause of this mistake. Rather, the democratically controlled board has slow walked and worse, 
objected to a proven viable method to achieving a lasting solution. The question I have is why? What are you afraid to find? Or worse, do you know what you will find and you want to keep it concealed? The Democrats wish to spin this as a purely politically motivated solution. It's true, politics are involved. Every single one of you up here had to run a campaign, save one. Everybody had to go and raise money, walk the streets, go and ask for people's support and persuade people to vote for you. To deny otherwise is a lie. Politics are involved. Further, a former teacher and BOE member has said it best. These curriculums today are and were always political. It's society run amok. It's not that the issue was made political. It was political from the get-go. So let's acknowledge that politics are involved, whether we like it or not. And politics are the only effective way to make a change. Lastly, the pizza and consent assignment was a mistake. Escape submitted by our school superintendent. Thank you. Since this was an escape or a mistake, the only reasonable thing to do is one, not sweep it under the rug and hope it doesn't happen again. Instead, perform a relentless root cause analysis and ask the hard questions. Who or what group or company developed the assignment? Who or what group approved the assignment? Who or what group released the assignment to the public schools? And if the analysis leads to the state, then take it to the next level. Ask the questions of the state. Please investigate this and do a meaningful, full-blown audit of the health and sex curriculum. Purge an all objective material, establish a meaningful and measurable checkpoint to safeguard this and to ensure this doesn't happen again. Mr. Please, Grande, your time's up. One, one last second. Please be intelligent people and act upon the valid concerns and requests of the tax paying resident. Thank you. Amanda Marquez. Amanda Marquez, Hoover Lane. When we talk about the infamous pizza assignment, the only word that this board and superintendent like to use is mistake. The definition of mistake is an action or judgment that is misguided or wrong. I think that the real mistake to come out of this whole situation is the lack of action exerted by the so-called leadership in our district. They are the ones who made the ultimate mistake. You see, for every action, or in this case, lack thereof, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The public's reaction to this assignment being brought to light is not surprising. An adult asked a room full of minors their sexual wants, desires, and boundaries. They instructed them to draw or color the sexual activities in relation to pizza and then hand in the assignment. Let's be really clear now. An adult asked minors their sexual desires in a classroom, period. Then, when the morality of this assignment and situation were questioned, the Enfield Public School System not only actively ignored these questions, they argued that it's state curriculum, that it ties back to standards and state law, essentially saying that Enfield Public Schools does not have a problem with this assignment because the state mandates a consent unit. And because the state mandates a consent unit, we are okay with asking minors their sexual preferences. The superintendent and members of this board have actively worked against parents to not answer the following questions. How did this assignment end up in the curriculum for use in the classroom? What does the edited assignment look like? Is that edited assignment still in the curriculum to be used for instruction? Being open and transparent about the situation from the beginning, instead of saying it was a mistake, should have stopped all the negative reactions. Instead, you have refused to talk about the situation, found ways to justify your behavior, and then blamed others or outside forces for causing the problem, and persisted in this behavior or action despite the negative consequences. Every single thing that has happened since this assignment came to light has been a direct result of your lack of action and leadership. It's that simple. Any resident, taxpayer, employee of the board, or citizen with an interest in our school system may address the board on issues concerning the schools. And when they do address issues, they should be met with open, transparent dialogue, not opposition and blatant disregard. I have spent my time in this chair respectfully asking questions that concern me as a parent, directing my questions and concerns to the board and superintendent. Meanwhile, others have sat in this chair and continually stated that since I have removed my children from this school system that I have no say here, and that is completely and utterly wrong. They continue to say that if we don't like it, we can homeschool our children and leave. 
Well, that doesn't sit right with me either. I have just as much vested interest in this town as anyone else, and I would never dream of belittling or bullying someone into leaving a school district because they had issues with it. Issues that I took the time to address with the people who had the ability to change, change them. But with every meeting that goes by, with no action taken against the situation, it only continues to add fuel to the fire and allows them to feel justified in their way of thought. Again, for every action, there is a reaction, and your lack of action has continually allowed this egregious behavior to continue, and it will do just that until you stop denying that there is a problem and actually address it. <laughs> Sheila Monroe. We on? Yeah. Um, Just remember your name and address, yes, and then I'll start the timer. Get that part. Hold on one second. The chair does not move. Okay. Uh, Sheila Monroe, 3 Stacy Lane. Um, I had a, a good three minutes to talk. Then I wasn't going to talk. There's a few things were said that you can't respond to until two weeks from now. Some things Mr. Jezik said. So uh, there's a few things. But anyways, this is where I'm going to go. I wasn't going to bring up the mistake, but let's, something perfect, let's make something perfectly clear. The mistake was nothing less than a criminal offense perpetrated on minors. Minors, yes, minors, period. FYI, a minor is a person under the age of a legal responsibility, which is under 18. Anyone in education or near or in the near vicinity of a minor knows that the mistake is something you need to stay away from with a 10-foot pole. That conversation on sexual preference, wants, and dislikes are no, no one's business, not even the parents. This is only taught to get into the heads of the children. Once you know the dark secrets of someone, especially a minor, they are vulnerable and become afraid that this information will get out to others. That is called control, and it's a sick behavior. To the parents whose children were blindsided by this mistake, and I hope they're listening, don't be afraid. Call the police. Report what your child experienced. These are minors. They deserve to be protected and not to be victims of an assault in the classroom. Plain and simple. They need to hear from you. Don't let other children fall victim as well. Absolutely no one here of official capacity tonight will help you now or in the future. And we've learned this, I've learned this from asking one simple question early on in COVID. Haven't gotten an answer yet. The only one that has come up with anything concrete is John Ungayer right there. And he is being belittled and laughed at right now by people who have no Respect. Here we go. Mm hmm. Uh huh. You got your little smiley face going on Facebook? Okay. Mrs. Monroe, I know. You're going to just address the board, please. I will. Then actually, you need to calm them down. Mrs. Monroe, it's actually people that you are here with that are actually nodding and agreeing with you saying, mm hmm. So. Well, I'm hearing it. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to have people point into the audience and disrupt this meeting. But I this don't want my the board. I'm, I'm going to stop your time. This is a meeting of the Board of Education. We have a full agenda tonight. We are elected to do board duties during these meetings. We allow public comment so that people can come and feel heard and be heard and report whatever they would like to report to the board. But there is board business that needs to be conducted. You want to come up here and direct anything you want to us. Fine. But the audience members need to leave audience members alone. Please continue. Thank you. Again, Mr. Ungeyer brought a proven study that could work for this situation that is being ignored. It's already a proven by a big tech company that puts thousands of dollars into finding out issues, resolving issues, and coming up with the, with the solution. And he is ridiculed for it. Why? I don't understand it, and it, they think it's because of religion. Maybe it's because he has a, a moral standard. <laughs> 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 Mr. 
Matt Schmidt. Matt Schmidt, 1304 Bigelow Commons. Good evening, Board of Ed members. The now infamous Enfield Pizza assignment occurred in mid-January, and here we are at the end of April. With all the time passed and the resultant drama surrounding the assignment, I think the seriousness of the issue may be getting lost. So I think it bears repeating here. Underage children were asked to reveal their sexual preferences to an adult. This is not trivial. It's not a so what type of thing. It's definitely not something a child should need to opt out of. And whether or not you think it was initially handled properly by the administration, the most important question going forward still remains unanswered. What is being done to prevent this from happening again? Because I don't believe it was some rogue teacher that snuck this in. And I would think even the Enfield Teachers Association agrees with me on that point. So there must be a process or a lack of one that allowed this assignment into our schools. If any of you know the faulty process, then please by all means tell us what it is and then tell us the action you are taking to change this process so it does not happen again. If you cannot hear name it and you have taken no action, then you cannot say that the problem is solved and you cannot expect the outrage to just go away. Now, the only proposal on the table is to discover the actual problem and fix it has been Mr. Ungeyer's task force. I have openly supported this idea and I believe it has great potential. This task force has been attacked, not based on its merits, but on the motivations and intentions of those who back it. Well, I could care less about motivations or intentions because I'm only interested in solutions. So if this board is going to dismiss Mr. Ongar's proposal, I would love to hear all of the other proposals that this board has come up with in the three months since the pizza assignment made headlines. I mean, you can hardly say support for Mr. Ongar's proposal is based on party affiliation when his is the only proposal put forward. You see, it's easy to criticize people or their character or their motivations, and all of these may be legitimate topics of discussion or debate. But what's imperative here is that we need to ensure that no child is subjected to such inappropriate material again. So if by now no other ideas have been put forward for this board to consider, then maybe instead of trying to prevent the loan proposal that has been presented, we should all work towards helping it succeed in its stated purpose. Because if you choose to sit on your hands now on arguably one of the most pressing issues that will ever come before this board, then what issue could any Enfield resident or parent ever trust you to address? Thank you. Joe Golis. Just Good evening, remember to Board state of Education. Your, you just have to state your name and address, and then I'll start your time. Okay. Uh, Joe Golis, uh, 31 Stardust Drive in Enfield, Connecticut. Good evening, Board of Education members. Good evening, administration. Good evening, Enfielders sitting behind me. I'm here today simply to put a science, historical, and math historical perspective on Enfield, which I haven't heard. I grew up in Enfield. 69 years. I wasn't here all during that time. I worked in the defense industry. I worked in the commercial industry for electronics. I know how electronics are made. I know how semiconductors are made. I was part of that until a decision was made to send it to Asia. I also worked in education because I had a choice in the 90s to go to Canada or down south because I have a degree in chemistry and biology. I can run a cracking plant and take petroleum and make it into useful products. And I hear this, we're getting rid of fossil fuels. No, we're not. Uh, 
I hear the language of the other subjects. That was us. I stopped your time, Mr. Colas. No problem. I'm of the old school generation. No. You want to put your cell phone on? I do not talk to you until your eyes face me. And this is what my students learn. Number one communication is your mouth, not social media. Number one, I brought my computer tonight. It's on my shoulders. Your brain. Do you know that my generation used this? You know what this is? It's a slide rule. We put the man on the moon with this, not your computers. Mr. Golis, is this what you want to talk about in your board comments? Because I stopped your time, but I didn't want to um, I set already, you off uh, track. Or, no, minutes? I stopped the time uh, because she had to turn off her cell phone. So I stopped the time so you could continue. OK, thank you. Yeah. OK, now, in terms of the way we taught, when I started in 96, we used a piece of chalk and a chalkboard. This is luxury. We created our own test. 16 years teaching. So unfortunately, I would respond to your comments, sir, but you're the general in the Army. I was on the battlefield. I never wanted to be in the front office. I had to deal with all the children. So let me make a quick comment about one of my students. Came from Egypt, did not speak English never had physical science or biology. They placed uh, my wonderful uh, um, um, uh, counseling, placed her in my class, chemistry. Guess what? She got an A in there. You know why? See this? It's a periodic table. We don't redefine the language. Hydrogen is hydrogen. Water is water. We don't redefine diversity, equity, and inclusion. Sorry, we don't do that. No, your time is up. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Kimberly Anderson. Hello. Kim Anderson, 34 Bass Drive. Good evening. I'd like to state for the record first that Ms. Pickett couldn't be bothered to recite the Pledge of Allegiance with the rest of us this evening. I have voted almost exclusively for Democrats in every election since I was 18. I was a registered Democrat at 18, and I believed past tense in many progressive causes over those 30 years. I very recently changed my affiliation after walking away from the Democratic Party permanently when they amplified and allowed Marxist ideology to take over their politics and their boards of ed. After this assignment came to light, I registered with the opposing partly, party, partly with the hope that there were some people who still had their moral compass about them, able to overcome their cognitive dissonance and be willing to stand up and demand answers. I give this background freely to prove this point. I have noticed that here in this room, there are people who want to pigeonhole and marginalize anyone who requests an investigation into this assignment as those Republicans, with all the smears and deflections and the isms and the ifs that go along with this mindset. This issue at hand is neither Republican nor Democrat, and concerned citizens span the spectrum of belief systems. That's the truth of the matter. But I've, what I found most disturbing was a simple insinuation made here recently. This insinuation was made by a resident at a recent meeting while looking into that camera. She made a plea to local students that went something like this. These people that are speaking out are dangerous and they are to be avoided. Stick with us, we'll keep you safe. This rhetoric is disgusting. It serves no purpose but to divide, and that is very damaging to the entire fabric of our community. It also serves as a nice little proxy to keep the conversation away from the topic at hand, but let's get to that question. How did an assignment asking what kind of sex a child desires 
make it into the classroom. I'll remind the board and the public this particular question of this assignment was not about health or safety, which is generally regarded as age-appropriate instruction. I'll remind the board and the public the children that were asked this question are 12 and 13 years old. And I'll remind the board and the public the age of consent in Connecticut is 16. The fact that it took place in a trusted setting is not an excuse. In fact, it makes it worse. If the question of tell me what you like to do when you have sex was raised to any child by an adult stranger, most people would be livid. If the same question was raised by adults in an, in an office setting to adults, it would be grounds for a sexual harassment complaint at the very least. I was raised in the 70s and the 80s to run like hell from old people with creepy personal questions. What is going on? <laughs> the superintendent answers to the board. The board, you answer to us. You are elected officials. I have one question. Why isn't the chain of command being utilized? Ms. Anderson, your time is up. Thank you. I'd just like to say one thing. There's a protest being planned at JFK. I denounce that protest. It's garbage. Everyone that I've spoken to denounces it. Nothing to do with it. Want nothing to do with it. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Liz Davis. Just want to make it known when my time goes over, I get to say a few more things too. <clears throat> Sorry, I've been sitting a while, my body doesn't move too well. Good evening. My name is Liz Davis and I reside at 201 North Maple Street. As we had plenty of people from the ERTC come up and discuss emails and how they would say, you had a group submit an FOI request of all your guys' emails of what was said to pretty much set up the Democrats on uh, the pizza assignment. I saw it as a parent, became very concerned because I actually do have a child in the school system. So I submitted the same FOI. Very disturbing, these emails that came in. So you're right, the one out of 4,000 that was the most important one, I'm gonna read again because facts are facts, not conspiracy theories, okay? Not, I heard this, or I, they might have said this. No, facts are facts. We're about facts. That's what education's all about, is facts. So this email came from an ERTC member, I won't state names, to Mr. Ungai of the pizza scandal. Hi, John. It was very cool to see the huge turnout at the most recent Board of Ed meeting. Sure it was, wasn't it? I was especially pleased that you picked up on the idea of that pizza assignment. And others like it were escapes and need to be addressed with a root cause analysis and last in corrective actions. Since the last meeting, the story has garnered national and international exposure. Please see the link below. This is not good. And as we know, escapes cost more than turnbacks. To that end, I believe the Lord has opened a door for us believers. The Lord has, right? Mm. For us believers to make a favorable change for the children on a state level. Let me explain. Since the story is now viral, John Kissel, Carol Hall should be contacted and brought up to speed. Next, let them know we're going to do a committee comprised of the Board of Ed members, teachers, parents, with the intent of finding the root cause of the escape. We know that this exercise will lead us to the state curriculum as mentioned by your fellow Board of Ed member. Kerr, we encourage your state rep. Is this funny, Mr. Ongeyer? I like my time stopped. I, I can't look up and have him laughing in my face. That's a bit rude. So I'd like to restart my time. I stopped your time when you were discussing. Thank you. you. Can start now. Thank you, ma'am. Excuse me, Ms. Davis. I am not laughing. We oh, are you laughing at your friends? Mr. Ongeyer, we cannot go back and forth. No, I'm, I no welcome, back and forth, I please, welcome, sir. Welcome, it's my John. time. Let them Thank have you. their time. We'll have our time. Okay, I'm going to start back. I let Davis have her say. All right, we've got it. We got it, Mr. T. Katz. We're, we're okay. going. <laughs> Thank I you, ma'am. I stopped your time. Nah. Thank you, ma'am. We encourage our state rep, or our state senator, Mr. Kissel, and our state rep. Ms. Hall to lobby for and hire a third party conservative audit group to perform a full scale of the audit of all Connecticut curriculum with the intent of providing a public report. More goes in by the end of the school year. 
Once the report is made public, we explored it to have the liberal Democrats blame the rhinos exposed. They objected to material purge just in time for the 2022 election. This individual, yes, I did put it on social media and has comment to it that he stands by everything in this email. Now we have that printed out too. Stands by it. So we stand by the Lord. The Lord, I'm sorry, does not open the door to bring harm to our teachers, our kids, and our administrators, which are false facts, your conspiracy theories, and your fake news. This was a mistake. And it was said, if you had actually a child in that class, you would have been told. And I thought you did this FOI to get your answers. You know what? Because it was a mistake. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Thank you, ma'am. I should keep going and add the rest. <laughs> Gina Sullivan. Gina Sullivan, 11 Spear Avenue. I'm continuing with the emails. A current town council member was emailed this statement regarding our superintendent. Your superintendent has stated on the news that this assignment was a terrible mistake. This perverted man is a terrible mistake to your school district. I certainly hope he is fired. It would be a blessing to your district. As a former teacher, mother of two, and grandmother of four young children, I was appalled and disgusted that anything of this nature would go out to school children. Shame on the superintendent and the teachers who gave it out. He responded and didn't disagree. Good evening, Jay. I certainly understand your concerns. I have included members John and Janet from our Board of Ed to address and reach out to you directly. Sincerely, Mike Ludwig. Janet Cushman responded, copying in John Ungeyer. Thanks, Mike, for forwarding. I reached out to her. It's pretty sad that no one has made any kind of comment about how inappropriate calling our superintendent a pervert from our elected officials. Nothing. Dear Ms. W, thank you for taking the time to express your concerns. Many of us are still quite stunned by the content of this lesson and that our students were exposed to it. Such subject matter does not belong in any classroom. Mr. Ungeyer, fellow board member, introduced the idea of forming a task force at our last meeting to look into how this error occurred so that nothing like this could ever happen again. The task force could also carry the responsibility of examining all curriculums closely to be sure that there are no more assignments like this one in any grade level. There is also a policy being suggested for our district. Note Ms. Cushman says the task force could also carry the responsibility of examining all curriculums closely. All. Big brother. All. That's not your job. <laughs> the narrative is following. That is not for you to say. I can end public comment now. You expect our kids to act a certain way when they're in school. We as adults need to lead by example. Can you guys please let everyone talk? Please. Thank you. Note that Mrs. Cushman said the task force could carry the responsibility of examining all curriculums. All. This narrative is followed, following closely to what the ERTC committee is representing. Here is an email from the ERTC member who saw this on the ERTC page. I happened to watch the Board of Ed meeting on 125 via YouTube and saw that it was abruptly canceled by Tina LeBlanc, who, as you know, is the Board of Ed chair. She said the future meetings would be online. I learned later this was because some parents were not wearing masks and had been denied access to the Board of Ed meetings at the town hall. Also, that the police were saying that they'd received a ticket and a fine of $100. My understanding is the acting town manager, former Democrat mayor of Bristol, Connecticut, recently instituted a mass mandate for public meetings. I watched the rescheduled Board of Ed meeting online 127. There was a mention at some point of the pizza thing. I had no idea what this was. On further research, I found it was referring to a lesson that was being taught in an eighth grade class, health class. Thank you. Time's up. Thank you. Uh, one more thing, because everyone else has. Um, if you're going to be proud of making your headlines to Fox News, take accountability when crazies come to JFK. You guys have asked for that. Yeah. Don't try to not take accountability for that. <laughs> Kelly Jackson. <laughs> Ugh. 
Kelly, is it on? Okay. Kelly Jackson, 30 Mead Lane. Cushman once said in a BOE meeting, there are things happening behind the scenes that you are not seeing here. And she is so right. On October 2nd, Janet Cushman emails a resident of one of their possible strategies, says that they're waiting on a response from FAIR's legal department. She explains to him how equity in education presents a direct challenge to the constituting, const I can't even say the word now, of the equal protection clause and anti-discrimination laws. October 5th, Janet emails the chapter leader of FAIR about a possible CRT being taught in school and complains about the EHS equity team and the implicit bias that she thinks is being taught. Asks what can be done legally. On October 12th, the re a resident shows up to the BOE meeting and speaks about the EHS equity team, implicit bias, and how we are in violation of the Equal Protection Clause and the federal and state anti-discrimination laws. On the 4th of November, Fair Transparency submits an incident report. On November 22nd, Fair Legal sends official documents. On November 23rd, another res well, same resident as the second or the 12th, comes before the BOE with a worksheet again about EHS equity team and speaks on discrimination. This time, he states a parent came to him with concerns. Brings up how a few weeks ago an incident report was by FAIR citing this and other teaching materials. Wants to put it on public record and read pieces from a lawyer submitted a, that was submitted legal documents from FAIR. On December 14th, another resident comes to the BOE meeting and mentions the same FAIR legal document. Wonder how that happened. Um, this timeline is quite disturbing. You are working with some that do not send their kids to our public school, but your own agenda is that strong that your willingness to take away from our kids and parents is heartbreaking. We have so many other issues that need to be addressed and help, but we can't because you are too biased. I will end with this. When you erase history experience of one kid to protect another, what you are saying is that there's one type of kid worth protecting. Oh, and by the way, Jean, where are all your emails? Funny everybody else has them but you. Lynn Kostek. Good evening. Lynn Kostek, 13 Teach Street. Oh, I need glasses. Okay, um, sticking with the emails. This one is from uh, Janet Cushman to prayer warriors. I'm not going to read the whole email because it's going to take me forever because she's Gabby. Um, for this term, I will be serving on the policy committee and as an alternate on the curriculum committee. Though it is often denied, it is very clear whether by deception or ignorance that our school leadership is pursuing principles of critical race theory. Social emotional learning is everywhere and it seems like very compassionate thing to embrace. And in some areas we are actually mandated to adopt policies about it by our state legislator. Yet it is a Trojan horse for critical race theory. And she mentions different areas for prayer, like in and out of school suspensions are extremely high in the past month not just at the middle school or high school levels, but also at Eli Whitney Elementary School. Um, so th that was an excerpt of one of her emails to uh, the BOE Prayer Warriors on November 16th, 2021. Now I got something to say. I've been sitting here meeting after meeting after meeting and then listening to all of this. And first of all, you don't mix church and state. And I'm looking at you and looking at you. And for two, two reasons. Number one, your people in your church, some of them don't even reside in Enfield and some of them don't even have children in the school system in Enfield. So they neither have interest in children or paying taxes. Therefore, they shouldn't have any reason to be here and speaking. Or you people putting your beliefs in their heads to come here and uh, 
and talk on behalf of you. I just had enough of this. I've been, I'm a transient here from Hartford. And just to, to listen to, you know, I, I've heard people saying that I grew up in Enfield and I'm proud of Enfield. Well, let me tell you, I'm a transient and I'm, and when people say, where are you from? I go, Enfield, because I'm, I'm embarrassed. I am embarrassed by what the Republican Party has done to us on public TV. Your time it, is up, Ms. Costick. Oh, and one last thing. Please join our Facebook page at Enfield Parents Seeking the Truth. That's where the facts are. <laughs> Emily Hulovich. Hi, everybody. Emily Hulovich, Three Cutter Lane. First, I'd like to congratulate Scott Ryder on being nominated and then chosen to receive the CEA Salutes Award. The Salutes Award recognizes individuals and organizations for the commitment to public education. He was the only one chosen out of the entire state this year, and I just wanted to recognize and celebrate that accomplishment. Well deserved, Mr. Ryder. <laughs> Secondly, I would like to discuss the hostility towards the teaching profession in this town lately. It's become glaringly apparent due to the release of the emails from the FOI request. I'm here to defend the teaching profession. We put our heart and souls into our classrooms and the people that cross that threshold every single day. We've had to read emails about the lack of respect people have for us. Our respect is compared to lower than used car salespeople. Um, and politicians, sorry. <laughs> we've been called stupid, insane, and crazy left-wingers. We've been accused of indoctrination. Now, there will be a rally at one of our schools in support of firing faculty. What people need to realize is that one of the faculty members listed is deceased. The lack of care and research that is being thrown into this political and religious agenda is horrifying. Our staff has been caught in the middle of this national movement. It affects our morale, and it's disheartening, and it needs to stop. Thank you. Peter Janitis. What? Shut up. Oh. While I'm walking up here, I resent the fact that you accused the first three rows that first time. It wasn't them. Peter, I'm not going to argue wasn't with them. you. them. I'm just telling Peter, you. Peter, I don't have to let you talk. Would you like to leave? Then why you're don't not you going to know what you're talking me. about? Know I can see about. what I can see sitting up here, and I'm not here to argue with you. You didn't hear I am it. here to conduct a board meeting. Can I have my three minutes, please? If you're going to be respectful, yes. I don't know about that. <laughs> okay, then I don't have to give you your three minutes. Okay. Name and address for the record, please. Peter Janitis, Three Farmstead Circle, Enfield, Connecticut. When we talk about the infamous pizza assignment, the only word that the board and superintendent like to use is mistake. The definition of a mistake is an action or judgment that is misguided or wrong. <clears throat> I think the real mistake comes out of this whole situation is the lack of action exerted by the so-called leadership in our district and they are the ones who made the ultimate mistake. You had kids sitting in a classroom and having an adult in a room filled with minors wanting to know about their sexual wants, desires, and boundaries. They were instructed, instructed to call, I mean, instructed to draw and color sexual activities in relation to pizza and then hand in the assignment. Now let's be clear. An adult asked these minors those sexual questions. Now let me ask you a couple questions. Next time you have a pizza, are you gonna look at the toppings and say, geez, I don't know how we're gonna to kiss tonight. Should we just regular kissing or French kissing or what? Look at another topping. Are we gonna do some petting? Who's gonna pet? And where's there's kids in the audience right now. And where they go to the same school, this is talking. Yeah, I'm not doing anything, no stop that. I'm ending, I'm ending public comment. Public comment is over. We're done. Elementary kids here. 
that's a cop out that I can't believe. A cop out is I have adults that, here that cannot sit in an audience and respect one another. But I'll talk we sit louder. up here I'll talk louder all then. the time Let me and talk listen louder. to every audience member with respect. Well, let's see if we every can try time. one more time. And then. you can have a lot to say about us, but do not deny us of the fact that we sit up here and we respect every audience member. I'm not interrupting. Peter. I'm not interrupting. Peter. What? I am not going to continue with the audience. We have been warned three times. Three times. Please be quiet. Please. How's that? Okay. I'm asking this group to please not say a word. Please be mindful that there is a child in attendance. Well, so are childs at these places. I understand, Peter. In the classroom. I understand. Would you like to remove the child for about two minutes? <laughs> well, I guess I'll have to be a little more gentle on the other two toppings that dealt with uh, my oral expression here, and uh, I don't want to act Can like. The audience, Sorry, Peter, I haven't started your time. Oh, okay. Um, please, everyone, if I ask again, I'm ending public comment, and I'm not dealing with this. I'm not. We have a full agenda of items that we have to talk about. One of them is Mr. Ungeyer's Pizza Task Force that he would like on the agenda to discuss. And the more time we talk in here, the less time we have to conduct board business. We are elected to have meetings to conduct board business. We are not here to sit and just listen to audience members the whole time. We have jobs, we have policy, we have calendar, we have budget. We have things we come here to pass and work on, what is in our town charters and within our town bylaws. And this prevents it. I'm not doing this. One more outburst, public comment is over. And then we'll decide as a board if we wanna continue public comment because we have that right going forward. And it's everybody in the audience, everybody. All right, Mr. Dinaitis, you're at one minute and 26 okay, seconds. Okay, so be polite going, then because of the I child in the audience. Time. Mr. Dinaitis, I did stop your time. I didn't take any of your time. You have a minute and 26 seconds left. So to be polite for the child in the audience, I will watch my oral statements and uh, try not to talk to this annually. Um, but the point is, and this whole thing just showed it. Now, if I ask you these questions, you feel uncomfortable. People back here feel uncomfortable. They're adults. How do you think a lot of the kids who sat in that classroom and their parents felt about that particular assignment? <clears throat> now, I'm totally messed up where I want, but I know we, we, we tried to justify this assignment because it was a state mandate. EP, uh, the Enfield Public Schools didn't have a problem with that because of that particular reason. I think all this situation, if you people had addressed this from the beginning and not made it a mistake, then it never would have gotten to this point. And everything that happened since this assignment came to light has been a direct result on your lack of action, leadership, and it's just that simple. I'm ending public comment with Peter. Board member comments? Order, Mr. Ungeyer, like we spoke? Sure. Okay, I'm going to go in alphabetical order. Did it work that way? Yeah. I thought we were talking. Okay, if it works that way, fine. Thank you. Mr. Cree? Good evening, everyone. On a lighter note, I'd like to start by sharing um, experiences that I had from attending the Enfield Arts Festival hosted by Enfield High School the weekend of April 1st and 2nd. I would like to congratulate all the students in our district that participated in this arts exhibition. The artwork was very impressive, and we do have many talented children in the visual arts across all grade levels. I also would like to congratulate the Lamplighters of Enfield High who performed last weekend. Their performance was outstanding, and their voices were beautiful. 
kudos to the creative team of teachers who also worked very hard to bring the best performance out of the students. I also have to report um, um, some events happening at Prudence Crandall. Tonight and on Thursday, April 28th, is the Scholastic Crandall Book Fair. So it'll be Thursday, since tonight has already happened, from 5.30 to 7.30 in the Crandall Gym. This is sponsored by both the Barnard and the Crandall PTO. There was a bake sale this evening, but moving forward on Thursday evening, there will be an ice cream social. I also would like to say thank you, Ms. Monroe. I liked what you said about moral standards, because I believe it's not about evangelizing our children. It's about having moral standards in this community and for our children. Thank you. Dr. Kelman. Okay. Um, well, I guess this is going to be a kind of a short one because it's uh, basically about Kite, and uh, we've already had a, quite an ample discussion about uh, uh, about Kite. Uh, Kite, along with uh, the Enfield Public Schools, Family Resource Centers, and the Enfield Public Library, celebrated the Week of the Child from April 4th to April 9th with a variety of activities, including rhyme time, uh, a Lego event, a uh, cooking class, a PJ story time, and a meeting with uh, Enfield Poet Laureate Elizabeth Suzek. All of these activities have one thing in common, uh, namely the joint involvement of children and parents. And this underscores the importance of relationships in fostering optimal early childhood development. A uh, kite uh, recently released the spring and summer edition of its community resources for young families, including information on COVID vaccination and testing sites, food assistance resources, family support resources, recreational activities, and housing assistance. Uh, Amy already talked about the 28 slots for Enfield Child Development Center, so I'm not gonna talk about that. I won't talk about the school readiness grant either. Uh, KITE has launched its annual self-assessment, a process facilitated by David Bechtel, a consultant who has worked with KITE over many years. Uh, the results of the assessment, which will serve as the basis for activities in the year to come, will be shared with the membership at the, uh, of KITE at the next May meeting. KITE leadership has reapplied for a grant extension from the Connecticut Philanthropy Foundation. And finally, KITE is participating in the recently launched Enfield Department of Social Services, Mental Health and Wellness Community Assessment. And I'll, I'll reserve those comments for uh, okay. item number 12 as, as, uh, as well as my uh, uh, finance committee report. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cushman? So I know there's been a lot about questioning the motives about what we do, what we do, but really it's about protecting the innocence of our children. Um, to that end, I just wanted to point out to some parents a new addition to our EnfieldSchools.org site. If you go to the EPS tech support page, there's a, um, a link for internet safety, which would take you to a document from schoolsafety.gov it's titled Online Safety Resources for K-12 Schools and Students. And it contains many helpful links and resources that will hopefully inform parents to help their children at home to be safe on their devices, just as much as it is for our school staff. And I just wanted to thank Guy Borassa for posting it so promptly after receiving it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hamry? Excuse me. Uh, I want to start by saying uh, that I want to share the condolences with the uh, to the Bosco. Extend my condolences to the Bosco family and to the family of Chris Rutledge. I want to uh, extend my appreciation and thanks to those that have extended their condolences to my family for the passing of Wayne Wayne Kinney. Uh, he was my father-in-law, 
and he passed away uh, rather unexpectedly um, under the employment of Smith Bus. And Smith Bus was absolutely fantastic in uh, responding to his concerns and has been very helpful to the family. We do appreciate their uh, support and uh, we know that they love Wayne as much as we do. I want to extend my um, appreciation as well to, uh, to what Gene had said earlier to um, Jack Winans and the entire collection that makes up the Enfield High School Lamplighters. They did an amazing job with three shows in two days for Once Upon a Mattress. And it's uh, a testament to the hard work that they put in to make those shows possible, to bring the magic of theater to life in our own high school. And it, I was reminded of the hard work that they put in for this show, as well as the one that they held outdoors in February on the sidewalk outside the high school because they were COVID compliant. And they did all of that because they were willing to, because they love what they do. They love the experience of theater. And to those seniors graduating this year, including one of my children, uh, it is a a melancholy moment that they may not have another chance to stand on stage and perform for their audiences and with their friends. So congratulations to them on a fine run, and I hope to see more of those shows in the future. Speaking of which, uh, the JFK, um, I don't have information specific to JFK beyond uh, the information for their theater production coming up. Uh, they were well represented, the JFK theater group at the high school for uh, the Lamplighters performance. They have their own show coming up for Moana Jr. And tickets are going to be available soon, if not already. I believe they are available at this point. Uh, but the show is going to be running May 6th through the 7th. And again, these are the junior high school children with three shows in two days. Um, if you've never been involved in a show, please take a look at it. If you have been involved in a show, you can understand what it goes, what goes into that. Uh, it, it takes a lot of energy, effort, dedication, commitment, and just determination to make it all happen. So having said that, um, I appreciate everybody that came out to speak tonight. I do wish that we had more civility in the conversations that we have, but I understand why we don't. The conversations at hand are very uh, gut-wrenching. They're very um, emotionally charged. And um, I appreciate the conversations. Thank you very much. Mr. LeBlanc. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, did you win your game? We did. We did. And field one. <laughs> Thanks for starting with that. Um, <laughs> um, so the way I've been viewing everything over the last few weeks, it's been a while since we had a, a board meeting, but the, the, the conversation's always been um, around the same subjects or s subject or subjects lately. Um, and kind of try to step back and I see there's one side, rightfully so, very upset about an assignment. There's another side that's very protective over our staff and our administration, and rightfully so. So you have those two. But right in the middle is the majority of town that just wants to get back to normal, that just wants the simple things from a school system again, to know what courses their, their schools are offering, to know what their kids' grades are in, in school, to know how the sports teams are doing, to know how when the next theater show is, um, who their friends are, their relationship with their teacher one-to-one. -one. That, it's that simple. People just want to get back to that, and that's the majority of the town. And I come to a board meeting every other week, and I listen to each side, right? And then I go out into the community, and I listen to that middle. That makes up the majority of our town. That just wants our school system to get back to normal. And have our school system be what Enfield Public Schools was. When I first came to the Board of Ed, we talked about this kind. We talked about um, new courses we were offering in the curriculum or, or where our test, test scores were. Um, if they you know, needed improvements here or were excelling in certain areas. 
I haven't heard an iota of that at all in the last, I, I can't even count how many meetings. And, and not to piggyback off uh, what Tina said, but there is, there's a full agenda. We got elected for this, the new business, A, B, C, D, E. There's a lot of stuff there. And it's not that I don't want to hear what the sides have to say, but it's just, it's, it's time, it's time we just get back to being Enfield Public Schools and, and what it was and what it can be, because there's a lot of good there. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Ms. Pickett? All right. Um, so, John LeBlanc, I'm going to piggyback on you. Um, and I appreciate um, kind of what you're sharing about wanting to hear more about where we're going in the future and what Enfield Public Schools is doing. So I'm not here to change anybody's beliefs. You're entitled to those. That's what makes our country um, so amazing. But we need to remember that in this space, which I wish I was physically there with you all, um, we're making decisions about public education, a cornerstone to our country's success. You will never be able to understand something that you have not experienced, but you can empathize and support. So in this position, it's critical that we, especially as Board of Ed members, separate our professional and personal values. Of course, our personal values and beliefs are, are what guide us. So we need to be self-aware and acknowledge when those beliefs are impeding or in conflict with the professional values that guide Enfield Public Schools, which is every student belongs here as they are. It is our duty to welcome, love, affirm, and support all of our students. I'm disheartened, but honestly not surprised by much of the content that's been addressed here tonight to see that for some of us, uh, our beliefs, religion, political agendas is more important than the students, staff, families, and the community that we represent. So I'm going to acknowledge that I ran as a Democrat, but I did not run because of that. I ran because of my kids. In fact, I honestly wish our boards were not politically affiliated. My babies attend Enfield Public Schools, and I'm proud to say that. Honestly, during Chris's um, report, I teared up as a mom to hear our superintendent speak so passionately about the students and the work that's happening in our district and being firm in his belief and work moving forward solidifies my desire to sit on this board and send my kids to Enfield Public Schools. I'm going to be honest, though. I knew that I was getting into when my husband and I chose to live here. It's never been a secret that Enfield schools are struggling and that there are improvements needed. This is clear in our academic and our behavioral data, which is publicly available on Ed's site. But the one thing that I know for sure is that the administration and the staff of Enfield Public Schools care about our kids. So the attack on our district needs to stop. It isn't helpful. Through my own personal experiences, I have found that there's so much more to the numbers and the data. My children are part of a district that loves them, cares for them, and pushes them to their greatest potential. Where an administrator responds to an anxious mom email on a Sunday night, a classroom teacher will text me to let me know my daughter's left her beloved donkey at school. Where classroom paras are regularly discussed at our dinner table with so much love and admiration. And where there's a PBIS coach who stands outside and greets every student by name, a smile, and a wave. For me, learning happens if students feel loved, secure, and affirmed. And I can tell you that there are countless staff and members of our community that are working really hard to do just that. That is why I'm here, because there are people that care and are ready to do the continued hard work ahead. I believe that there's dream makers here in Enfield Public Schools. I wish I was one of them, but I'm a board member, and I think it's my job to actually make their job easier. Instead of slandering our administration or impeding the meaningful work of educational equity, we should be willing to support ways to help our students, staff, and families like by addressing the behavioral, mental health, and academic needs through intentional interventions, partnering in meaningful and sustainable ways with our community partners, connecting families to schools in collaborative ways, and by providing structural supports for staff, like things like scheduling and come-in planning time, coaching, all while paying careful attention to all of our students, but especially our students with IEPs and 504s, our multilingual learners, our students of color, students who identify in the gender continuum, and a few that I probably wouldn't have added this list, but thanks to last meeting, Maureen, our gifted and talented students, and Josh, our students who thrive in the arts. This is why I ran, and this is why I believe I was elected. I believe that we're here to, to create change that many of my colleagues are working really hard to support. 
positive, sustainable, and meaningful solutions that can cause impactful change. So I want to address a few things that have come up in public comment and in Chris's um, superintendent report. One is um, around the alliance possible designation. I want to also make that really clear um, that this is not yet um, you know, written in, in stone, um, but it's not a shock. I already said that. Um, I knew that when I looked, when I was moving to Enfield, we have teetered on this designation for a really long time. Um, I actually came here as a mom a year and a half ago, concerned about data, um, and I continue to share those concerns and possible solutions. But I believe in our leadership to use this as an opportunity to make systemic shifts needed to create the outcomes that we're all looking for. I will continue to advocate for staff, student, and family partnership in the process moving forward. And I also hope that this designation is not a long-term dependency, but an opportunity to build on other funding um, so we can get the, the ship um, headed in the right direction. Um, a couple other things, um, Chris, I don't know if you can answer these questions and you don't actually have to answer them tonight, um, but I know information has gone out about summer school. Um, me as a first grade parent, I've received two opportunities, one um, for a summer program through Enfield Public Schools, a summer school program, um, and I recently got one about an arts camp um, that sounded really cool and exciting. Um, my eager first grader uh, sleeping upstairs was actually interested in summer school and art camp. So I don't know if what's possible as far as can students sign up for more than one. Um, what else is available? I know our ERFC and Town and Rec are offering their summer escape camp and tons of fun. Um, I encourage families to check out ERFC, Town and Rec, um, and Enfield Public Schools websites for more information. And Chris, I know I've shared this with you in email, but I will say it publicly. Um, and maybe if Ellen is listening, I would love if on our town website, there was a, a page for families to be able to access summer um, activities for, for kids in town. And it could be even bigger than camp. It could be library offerings, um, you know, other things that families might be interested in. Um, but I think it'd be helpful if there was a spot that families could access summer programming um, in an easy, accessible way. Um, Enfield Street School is planning a family fun run um, on May 6th from 4 to 7. Please check out the principal newsletter, the PTO page, um, lots of fun things going on there. Parkman also has many activities um, on May 3rd, a teacher appreciation lunch on the 4th, um, nomination for new PTO members at 6 p.m. at the library. On the 7th um, from 9 to noon is the PTO 5th grade committee is hosting a 5K slime run walk. Um, the money raised will go to fifth grade end of year celebration and the student who raises the most money will get to slime a teacher, tutor, or lunch aid. Um, ERFC continues to have before and after school programming for K-5 and um, a teen program for JFK and their summer school program. Um, and I know the task force and the agenda item, so I'll save my comments for that. Um, but I do just want to let folks know that Family engagement is something that I take very seriously um, and I think is really important. And it has come up in many curriculum committee meetings, actually, about how do we share information with families? How could we better partner? Um, so this is not something that's being ignored, um, but I think a, a more intentional, positive um, outcome uh, is needed. So I will address that during that agenda item. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pickett. Mr. Ungeyer? Because you were there. He wasn't there. Yeah, I wasn't. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't see you there. It was online. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> so on, on the 19th, on the 19th, I attended the Hazardville Memorial PTO meeting. And this was the first in-person PTO meeting that they held in two years. And so it was... Uh, very refreshing just to every, for everyone there to uh, get together and uh, talk about what uh, what's coming up at Hazardville Memorial. And they had a spring picnic tonight, and that was um, postponed because of the weather. And on June 10th, Hazardville Memorial is having their field day. And there's a rain date of the 17th. And they're going to have uh, make up T-shirts. And it'll be sack races and face painting and all of those good things. So that's what's upcoming at Hazardville Memorial. Some of the things they were talking about. So I may as well just 
Um, let's see. I also intended a um, joint facilities meeting chaired by Gina um, Sakala, who's here. Oh, uh, you can you can address that during joint facilities. You don't have to address uh, it right now. Okay, let's do that. Yeah, when we do our committee report. Sure. Yeah, you Got can it. do it then. Yep, yeah. I'll do it then. All right, perfect. So... I'll just move right into right into this. So um, you, you know that I had uh, proposed a uh, task force, and so I'm going to speak about that. And um, so at the February 8th Board of Education meeting here, it was standing room only. This room was filled with people. There were reporters, news cameras, and everyone here all in response to the pizza consent assignment. And it was very clear that most of the room was overwhelmingly in opposition to the assignment. Superintendent Dresick clearly identified the release of that assignment as a mistake. Coming from an industry that cannot tolerate mistakes, meaning aerospace, I saw an opportunity to potentially help. That evening, I suggested to this board uh, the formation of a board-appointed task force to address the mistaken release of the pizza consent assignment. Uh, this, this suggestion, this proposal was not intended to point fingers or to s assign blame at anyone. It was intended to understand and determine what in the process allowed this mistake to happen and then recommend solutions to the administration to prevent it from happening again. I suggested that the composition of the task force um, committee include a range of members from parents, administrators, and perhaps even some board members. In our last BOE meeting, I provided a presentation that introduced to this board a well-proven and established industry method for determining uh, root causes of mistakes. And this was the 8D presentation that, that I presented. And I wanted to thank uh, Guy Barassa and the uh, video staff here for your help in, in getting that up. Since that time, I've heard many different people um, say many different things. So I'd like to address some of that. Some people object to the term task force. Um, they agree with the formation of a group or committee, to look into this and other issues, but don't like the nomenclature task force. Um, I understand this. Many associate the term task force with some sort of like police task force that's looking for someone to blame. Um, and many people think that it sounds just too forceful. So I think that's just fine. And I'm all in favor of calling it something else perhaps something a little less forceful. And so with that, mind, with that in mind, for the remainder of this talk, I will refer to the uh, task, I won't refer to it as a task force, but as a, as a committee, okay? Some people say that you're not supporting our administration or our teachers. To that I say, not true. Not only not true, but quite the opposite. Offering to help and assist the administration by using well-established methods and proven tools in determining root causes of a mistake and then to provide solutions and recommendations back to the administration is fully supportive of the administration. This process is not intended to find fault or to assign blame on anyone. It's intended to make the educational system better by preventing mistakes from reoccurring. It's critically important that we understand what in the process allowed this mistake to occur. When parts break on an airplane, you look at the process. You look at the process that produced it. Where did the materials come from? Where were they certified? Where was the parts machined? Were they machined to blueprint dimensions? You take a look at the inspection records. Well, what if the quality manager said, hey, uh, you can't see the inspection records. Well, there's, there's nothing to see here. Well, it might appear that the quality manager is trying to hide something by not providing visibility to those records. This is why visibility to a process is so very important. 
Some people have said that the formation of this committee is political. The formation of this committee was, was proposed as, and is being proposed as bipartisan. So just, that it wouldn't be, just so that it wouldn't be viewed as political. The importance of it goes far beyond political interests. It has the best interests of our kids at heart. Some people have said, hey, everybody makes mistakes. Well, that's true. Everybody does make mistakes. And knowing this is exactly why we need to understand how this mistake happened and how we can prevent it from happening again. Years ago, I, I, um, I earned my private pilot's license. And one of the first things they do and teach you as a student pilot is to always use a checklist. And why do they do this? They do this because they know that everyone makes mistakes. And so they created a process that's designed to help limit the opportunity for mistakes. And this checklist process is not, not just intended for new student pilots. It is a process that is used by all pilots, always. Even pilots who have thousands of hours in the aircraft type are still required to use checklists every single time. Some people say, well, let's just move on and put this behind us. Well, I guess many years ago, I remember having a toothache, and I believe that, well, given enough time, that it would just go away by itself. Well, I learned the hard way, as perhaps some of you have, that just ignoring a problem does not make it go away. I also learned that it's better to take care of problems early on before they turn into even bigger problems. Ignoring a problem doesn't make it go away. Problems just don't go away by themselves. Mistakes just don't fix themselves. We must be mindful that we do not own these kids. It's the parents who entrust their kids with us. And there's an expectation that we will provide their children with a quality education and that we will take care of them while we're educating them. Some people say, hey, we're removing our kids from the Enfield Public Schools. And I find that very saddening to hear of families that have removed their kids from our schools. In essence, what they're saying is they're firing us. They felt that we failed doing our job. What were you if in business and your customers fired you? Or many of your remaining customers are only there because they have no other place to go. Some people say, I can't believe this is happening, and why can't it all go away? It is said that you can't unring a bell. However, you can prevent it from ringing again. And when you drop a rock in the water, you will then begin to see the ripples going out from it. Many of us here this evening have been affected by those ripples. So what are these ripples that we've seen? A room full of concerned and angry parents, reporters, the local press, TV cameras, local news, state news, national, international, and global news, terrible, nasty grams sent to our good superintendent and his good staff, criticism of our outstanding teachers, having police standing guard in our meetings. I've received communications from friends as far away as Alaska and England and saying, and please pardon my language, but, quote, what the heck are you guys doing in Enfield? All of it, all of it, all of it are the ripples that resulted from that one rock that dropped in. Sure, a mistake was made, but we must learn from our mistakes and we must correct them. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's not about us. It's about our kids and we should never, ever lose sight of that. Calling for the formation of a committee that seeks to protect our kids and protect our administration and community from anything like this happening again is not a bad thing. It's a good thing, and it's a responsible thing for us to do as a board. So in closing, this community elected us to these important positions because they have faith in us. The formation of this committee is a sincere opportunity for us to use our important positions to do important things. By forming this committee, we can involve our community 
and administration to work together to address important issues facing our schools. In addition, this cooperative effort will serve in helping to restore for many in our community their faith, their confidence, and their trust in the Enfield Public School System. To my fellow board members, I'm calling on you to support the formation of this committee. Show the Enfield community that you care and protect their kids from future mistakes. This is not being proposed as a Republican idea or a Democrat idea. This is being proposed simply as a good idea. Mr. Ryder. So uh, to Ms. Pickett's point, she brought up a question about summer school. I can address that. So there is summer school links up on the Enfield Public Schools website as well as EnfieldPTO.com in each of the school pages sites. The deadline to apply for summer school is this Friday. So please look for that link and fill that out. Um, we are offering free summer school again this summer. And we're hoping that we can accommodate every student that signs up. But if you don't sign up by this Friday, we won't have the accurate numbers. We don't have the accurate counts. And we won't be able to accurately staff it. So please fill that out by this Friday. And then going forward, we can make our plans with how many classrooms we'll have available. Uh, certain buildings, you have to remember, over the summer are having their roofs renovated. So if you go to Eli Whitney or you go to Hazardville Memorial School, your summer school will not be in your school. There'll be one location for certain grade levels, other, other locations for others. Um, but please look for the summer school forms um, because, again, the deadline, if you are interested, is this Friday. Okay, so I wanted to answer that summer school question. Um, so since we last met uh, four weeks ago, but three school weeks ago, we had April break. Hope everybody had a great April break. Welcome home, all of our friends from Riley's that danced at Disney. Um, Last week at Eli Whitney, the Connecticut Humane Society came in and did a presentation for our fourth graders. Uh, third graders attended a demonstration by the Enfield PD K-9 unit. Uh, we celebrated Earth Week by opening our recycling center here in our school at Eli Whitney, collecting specific trash items to trade in for cash with TerraCycle. And those uh, monies will go to uh, fund school programs. Uh, a local author came in to visit, uh, Teresa Pelham. Uh, last Friday with her dog, Roxy, to share a book with our students. Uh, students and staff were able to wear their pajamas last Wednesday to support Enfield's Loaves and Fishes um, by making a donation for their grand opening, which is coming up May 1st, yes. Um, uh, Eli, our Eli Whitney students collected over $160 and an assortment of personal care items. So they got to trade in um, bringing in like a new toothbrush or deodorant, personal care items, uh, again, uh, for the opportunity to wear their pajamas. Uh, also today, before it rained, our fourth graders took their first field trip since they were probably in first grade <laughs> and they went to go see the Hartford Yard Goats game. Um, also in case, um, oh, the I, I wanted to mention the uh, spare change for superheroes that we talked about with uh, Hazerville and Whitney did together. Uh, they ended up raising, in the end, $1,184, so almost $1,200 that our kids raised. Uh, upcoming events at Eli Whitney, SBAC testing continues this week. Please make sure your iPads are charged overnight. Uh, they come in fully charged each day for testing. Uh, progress reports are going out at the 3-5 level, and I believe the K-2 level as well. Uh, progress reports going out this Friday, electronically. Uh, fifth graders will be receiving each fifth grader is getting a sapling on Friday in celebration of Arbor Day. Um, my daughter, now in eighth grade, uh, off to the high school this fall, got her tree on Arbor Day in fifth grade at Eli Whitney because they've done this for many, many years. And we are now up to about waist height in the backyard. I have to be careful not to mow it over. Um, also coming up next week is their spring buy one, get one free Scholastic Book Fair. If you go to EnfieldPTO.com slash Eli Whitney, you can sign up if you're a parent in that building to help at the school shop. Also, one of our custodians has built by hand, this is something that he does to pass the time and something that he did over COVID. He's built over 25 birdhouses. Each birdhouse is individual. 
each one is painted differently. Some are on stands, some you hang from a tree. And he has donated all of these to the Enfield Public Schools. So we are starting with Eli Whitney's spring uh, family event next week on Wednesday, May 4th. And we're gonna be auctioning off about a half a dozen of these birdhouses made by our custodians and all proceeds are gonna go to charity. And this is an opportunity that I'll be emailing the other PTOs in town this week because we want, instead of having one school do a fundraiser and raffle off 25 birdhouses, my suggestion uh, to this amazing man was, how about, if you don't mind, we break it up and we send four or five to Henry Barnard and four or five to Crandall and, you know, a couple to Parkman and Enfield Street and kind of try to, instead of selling 25 to one school community, spread it out amongst our entire town, which he thought was a fantastic idea. So look for an email from that from me to the PTOs this week. Uh, there's one more Prudence Crandall note that I got through uh, my PTO connections. Um, one of the teachers reached out with the following note. We wanna share some of the hard work that Crandall has recently put into helping our community. Every year, Prudence Crandall goes crazy trying to get the food boat to sink. Now, for those who don't know, the Enfield Food Shelf has a wooden canoe that travels amongst all of our schools. And when it visits your school, the goal is to make it sink by filling it with non-perishable food items. So when Mr. Sills became our principal, he allowed us to set up incentives. The first year we broke the record for the most items ever donated by any one school in Enfield. This is Prudence Crandall. One school had raised 1,440 pounds, almost two tons of food. We were able to stick Mr. Sills to the wall in the gym during an assembly. I assume with gaff tape. <laughs> um, this year, we challenged our students to try to beat that. So for every 50 items, the students earned a water balloon to throw at Mr. Sills and our vice principal, Mrs. Dennis. We are proud to share that we recently collected 4,461 items weighing 3,296 pounds, which will provide over 5,273 meals for needy families in Enfield, Connecticut. We almost doubled our record from 2019, and Mr. Sills and Mrs. Dennis will become target practice this June at an assembly with a lot of water balloons heading in their direction. Um, one more note regarding the food shelf. I'm also a graduate of Parent Leadership Academy, which is another KITE program. Thank you to KITE for speaking earlier today. Um, so the 10th annual Enfield Townwide Tag Sale is coming back this year. Again, this is something else that's been on pause for two years due to COVID, um, but it is back. Um, for anybody that isn't familiar, you donate $25 directly to the Enfield Food Shelf through the Townwide Tag Sale link on the Enfield Food Shelf's website. You give them your $25 tax deductible donation, that gets you on our maps. We pass out tag sale signs the weekend prior to uh, the tag sale, which this year will be back in its normal slot, which is always the Saturday after Mother's Day. So this year will be Saturday, May 14th, from nine to three, rain or shine. Um, so if you register before, uh, before or on April 30th, um, you'll be registered, so just go to enfieldfoodshelf.org, or I have some flyers. If anybody wants any on their way out, I can leave them on the public communications table. So I wanted to mention that as well. Um, I have one note that is taking place at the high school, but doesn't steal your high school thunder. But it is taking place at the high school this Thursday, April 28th from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, if you're not familiar, we do have a local Chamber of Commerce, the North Central Connecticut Chamber of Commerce, along with Enfield Public Schools and Kite, are hosting an employment and family resource fair outside in the parking lot at Enfield High School this Thursday from five to seven. The event will feature over 30 vendors. You may have heard a robocall about this this week, but I'm just doing my, doing my duty. Um, some will have on-site jobs to apply for right there. They have openings, that's why they're there. They're looking for Summer jobs for our students, any age eligible student should definitely stop by because there'll be summer jobs available, temporary employment, as well as full-time regular employment from over 30 vendors. Um, this event, again, like I said, is also ideal for teens looking for summer work. 
This event is completely free to attend. It was free to our vendors that are displaying items uh, as far as job opportunities or uh, family resource opportunities, daycares that have opening spots or spots that'll be open this fall when some of their five-year-olds move on to kindergarten that frees up spots in some daycares, et cetera. Um, so we'll have information regarding that. There'll also be at least two, maybe more food trucks on site. We have Kona Ice with uh, ice cream and uh, frozen desserts and the Cinco de Mayo taco truck, which is normally parked right over here on the pond. Um, so those two food trucks will be there. We may have a third one there as well. So we just hope you come out. Uh, there's no rain expected, but there may be some wind. But uh, this Thursday, 5 to 7, outside the high school parking lot, um, we can talk about our root cause task force when we get to that agenda item. Do you want to do that when you do high school? Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is that one of our roles that we all take seriously, and I certainly take it very, very seriously, is that we are liaisons to our schools. It is something that we are responsible for and something that we are to report on at meetings, as well as our other questions that come up when the line item is about sports updates or test scores. That's when we ask those questions. But when it's our turn to talk about this, one of the things we should be including is our updates about our schools. Now, whether that's as simple as I went to the high school musical and it was amazing, or you know, I went to an HMS PTO meeting, that's one of the things that we're supposed to do. And the adopts a school roster has recently been changed slightly. So I just wanted to give my PTO friends uh, a heads up that at Henry Barnard, Jonathan LeBlanc is your Board of Ed liaison. Prudence Crandall, Janet Cushman is your Board of Education liaison. Enfield Street is Amanda Pickett. Hazardville Memorial, John Ongeyer. Parkman, uh, Miss Gina Cree. I represent Eli Whitney, as well as PTO functions in general. JFK, Joshua Hamray. Enfield High, Chairman LeBlanc, who will be speaking next. Uh, Suffield Voeg, our relationship with them, that's kind of handled by Board of Ed leadership when we're invited to events, as well as ETLA, Enfield Adult Alternative Education Center uh, opportunities that's handled by Board of Ed leadership. We have Dr. Callen and Jonathan LeBlanc, uh, who are our Stowe Early Learning Center and Head Start reps. And Eagle Academy is also handled through BOE leadership. And our kite liaisons are still Jerry Callen and Jonathan LeBlanc. And uh, thank you, everybody, and please be conscious to keep our schools on your forethoughts because we don't put enough emphasis on what our schools are up to, and the school community is what I ran on, um, and that's something that I've been promoting since the first day my daughter started kindergarten, who, again, will be at high school in the fall somehow. So thank you very much. Okay, I will, I will try to make this quick, but I have a lot of thoughts I want to share. I almost want to be like the principals during an assembly where they tell everybody, stand up, stretch, you know, then sit back down. Your eyes are starting to gloss over. It's getting late. We've all had a long day. Um, but there's a couple of things I want to address after um, my school updates. Um, the first thing I want to say is... Um, through myself <laughs> to the superintendent um, and my leadership, I need to remember to put the new subcommittee um, a, a appointees on the agenda. Um, I don't know that we have officially have to do one for Dr. Callan for the mental health, um, but if we want to do um, Gina Cree as the alternate, we can certainly make sure we do that and the ECAC for next agenda. I think it has to be an agenda item so that we can appoint everybody properly. Can I see the town liaison, the, the liaison list? Sure. This is my fault. And I don't know why, Is it if it's Parkman or Prunes Crandall. Okay, Miss Cushman, you are the liaison for Crandall or? Yeah, but I mean, but we had discussed changing it back and that was what the email was about. Okay. So now on so, Crandall. Okay. Well, this is what's posted on our website. Yeah, no, so but they, they had a change and that was okay. my fault. So Mrs. Acree is going to be Crandall and Mrs. Cushman is going to be Parkman. Yep. All right, we will... Um, Kathy, can you note that? Okay, Kathy's going to note it, and then she'll put a new one out. Um, I don't know why that's confusing to me. I don't know why I can't get that straight. But thank you for clarifying that for me. Um, the other thing I want to say is um, 
Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, Ryder is getting, um, he's getting an award. It's called the CEA Salutes Award, which recognizes outstanding contributions to public education by an individual, an individual organization. Um, it was submitted by a local teacher and was re reviewed and judged by the PR Commission and approved by the CEA's Board of Directors. He can bring some guests. He's not committing to who he's bringing yet, but um, I'm sure it's going to be his family. But uh, me and Deputy Mayor Scala would like to attend. Um, but we can go to the event and, and maybe just crash. Um, so congratulations to you, Mr. Ryder. Um, if if you have ever served with Mr. Ryder, you kind of wonder how and when he sleeps. So that, that's that. Um, I, too, went to the art show, and it was great when I went there because so many people were commenting how many board members um, went to the art, art show. I, I think I missed um, Mr. Kareem, Ms. Cushman. You went on Friday evening. I went on Saturday, and uh, Mr. Hamry and Mr. Ryder were there on Friday as well. Um, I just want to say a couple things about that. I wish I could have purchased some of that student's art. It was beautiful. Um, we have very talented artists um, in this town. Um, and we had talked about the theme being upside down, and we didn't know what that meant. And um, what they did was, um, I think it was Prudence Crandall, they put um, painting paper underneath the tables, and they painted as if they were painting you know, the Sistine Chapel um, so to that effect. So they were painting upside down. I think the kids at Parkman painted with their paintbrush upside down. So they painted with the edge and not the bristles. Um, JFK had an upside down house. Um, the artwork and the imagination of the kids in pottery uh, was beautiful, and it always makes me proud to go to that event and so the kids can show t showcase their art, and then they have music playing at the same time which I thought was amazing. Um, there is a lot of events coming up at Enfield High. Um, the Senior Prom is Friday, May 20th. Awards and Scholarship Night is May 25th. The Class Picnic, um, SafeGrad released their packets. Um, the reason why I talk about SafeGrad is it's very near and dear to me. It's a big job for a lot of very few people to raise close to thirty to forty thousand dollars to send um, all the graduating seniors to a drug-free, alcohol-free event at Sunny's Place at no charge to the community, um, to their parents. So it's important to me. So when I give updates like that, it's because I want the community to know um, what we're doing for the students. We have three hundred and eighty students that graduate on um, graduation, and then that could mean students from the prior. Uh, class. Um, also, uh, Chef O, the sixth annual Empty Bowls fundraiser, um, was successful this year, raising $1,000 for the Enfield Food Chef. Food Chef. Empty Bowls is an annual fundraiser made possible through the collaborative efforts between the Culinary and Visual Arts Program at Enfield High. Each year, ceramic bowls created by students and staff of the ceramics department, soups handcrafted by the culinary department, an empty bowls cookbook written and illustrated by the culinary and commercial arts students are sold at the, all, the arts festival. All proceeds from the fundraiser are donated to the Enfield Food Shelf. And since the fundraiser's inaugural year, Empty Bowls has raised almost $10,000 for the food shelf. A special thanks to Chef O and his advanced culinary students, Michelle Nassau and her Empty Bowls Club, and Amber Pasco and her commercial arts students for their hours of dedication to their local community. Please join us by congratulating everyone that participated. Okay, one of the things I wanna address tonight is um, when people come up here and give an address of 155 Raffia Road. There is a policy, and I'm gonna give you the policy. It's policy 9325.2, number eight audiences. Any resident or taxpayer of Enfield or any employee of the board may address the board on issues concerning the school. That means any teacher, any staff member, a para, secretary, lunch, lunch aide, anybody who is a, an employee of Enfield Public Schools can come up and address the board. And a few people have come up and threw up 155 Raffia Road, and we know what you're doing. And in the same breath, you say you're not attacking teachers. That's cynical. Just use your home address. The teachers have a right to come and speak, even if they don't live in Enfield, because they are employees of the Board of Education. So I wanted to clear that up first and foremost. Next. As the longest standing member on this board, I have seen a lot of, um, a lot politically wise in school. Um, I have some former board members sitting in the audience that I was very happy to be able to serve with. Um, they cared about the kids. What was different about the time I served with them is the time I'm serving now. It's divisive, right? What's frustrating to me, to all of you, is that I have gone to John and Janet, Jean, Jonathan, 
And I have said, don't see me as a door to what you're trying to accomplish. And you can attest that I have said that. And I have my side to the left. Now my political affiliation happens to align with my side to the, ele to the left. But my job as chair is to help bring this board together and help how I can. I do not have to agree with what they want done, but I'm not going to hinder it. Mr. Ongeyer has asked me to meet for coffee, talk about, I'm not gonna use the word tax force, committee, <laughs> we have talked about it. Ms. Cushman would like to look into iPads. We went together and we talked about the iPads. I honestly think sometimes what's hindering us is the divisiveness coming out there because we are trying to work together. I feel we are trying. The other night at policy, Janet presented something and Scott said, can you keep working on it? I want you to feel heard because I wasn't always heard. So she's going to. And she knows and Jean knows just because we are in charge of the committees that at any time they want to bring something up, there's a process. Bring something up from the table, we'll add it to the agenda, we'll talk about it. What the public is doing is making assumptions on what is actually happening on this board. And there have been residents, and I'm, I, I'm sorry if I'm going to use your names, um, that have contacted me. And not only have you contacted me, you have been respectful and you have offered solutions. And then when you come up and speak, you do not use what anybody has said at the microphone against them. And that's Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Schutz, and Rob Anderson. I appreciate that because you know we don't agree. Now, do we have people that come and speak for what you think is more our narrative? Absolutely. And you're going to see that all the time. But it is our job to work together, and it is your job to let us do that. Because there are nine people up here that represent every member of Enfield, Connecticut in some political, educational way. Now, we don't agree, but it, who, is, is the world a better place if we all agree? No. Now, do we owe it to our students to, to get to where we want to be? Yes, we understand your concerns. Do we agree with them? Not all the time. And that's straight across the board. They don't always understand everybody's concerns either or feel that that fits what they would like to see done. What I'm saying is you come up here and say we're divisive. I don't feel that we are. I feel like we are trying in a very, very negative political world to try to not be involved in that and just be a board of education. We have board business that we have to do. And it's very disheartening that I feel like we can't even do that work. Now, yes, our hands were tied with the masks. We got it. And we had a side that said, I don't care. Get them off. And we had a side that didn't. We got through it. People wear masks if they want. But at the time, there was direct actions working against a new board. New board. Now, the other thing I will address that is bothering me. When you put something out on social media, call the newspaper, whatever, there's unintended consequences. And to turn the narrative around and say, because you didn't do anything as a school district, and that's, an, that's what your opinion is, you are getting these threats. It's because of you. I don't like that. Actions have unintended con consequences. And unfortunately, the consequences are happening to our school district. They're happening at JFK. That brings down the morale of our teachers. The teacher's morale is already down working through COVID. Stop, because it's not any of you who come and speak to us and tell us you're displeased. It's going to be somebody who is not local that has nothing to do with Enfield, Connecticut, that's going to do something crazy. And all everybody wants to do is point blame. Well, sometimes 
you want to see accountability up here? Well, I need to see accountability out there because it's not okay. There is never justification for threats, anything, anything to happen. And to what has happened to board members and employees is disgusting. And now parents are scared to send their kids to school. And I know some people clarified about what's happening this weekend, but that's scary. This isn't our town. This isn't how we act. This is not how we want Enfield to be remembered. It is not. And a lot of people sitting here looking at me right now grew up here. I've stayed quiet long and I've listened to all of you. And I've appreciated that you've come up and spoken and I hear you. But I also think that when you come into this council chamber and the negativity and the yelling and the disrespect, we're not allowing it anymore as a board. It's not fair to any of us. Public comment is a privilege, believe it or not. And some towns don't even have it. And we will not remove it because we don't want the residents of Enfield to feel silence. But we're asking the residents of Enfield to let us do our job and have a more productive conversation. I appreciate solutions that are suggested to me. We are a new board of education. We've been sitting here for six months. We are trying. If you guys don't feel like we are trying, we can figure something out and move forward. But there are every single one of us brings something positive to this board. And I can tell you different things that everybody brings. Miss Cree, she loves the music and arts. When she talks about young kids, her face lights up, especially when she talks about music and art. Miss Cushman loves books. She's gotten involved with first readers so she can get the kids more involved with books. Mr. Ungeyer and me have had coffee and I have actually, <laughs> I'm afraid to fly. And so I told Mr. Ungeyer, you're going to have to get me ready for my, my next plane trip. I've had nice conversations with Mr. Ungeyer about me not being a door and me being a window. I've had conversations with Jonathan about how he wants to see different things happen with sports teams, or he does have focus on diversity. Mr. Hamry, he also loves the arts. Dr. Kalnan is so invested into Kite and um, the mental health committee. Amanda Pickett and Jonathan are both invested in early learning childhood. Scott, he just wants to do everything he can for all the schools. I mean, he's, he's doctors, he's cat in the hat. He, he will do whatever you ask. He's a DJ, he's this and that. Well, none of us get paid for what we do, but we do it because we love it. And we do it because we were elected to do that. This divisiveness is coming from you. You guys have to figure it out. And attacking your board members is no way to get a board to work cohesively with you. I don't care if we're Republican. I don't care if we're Democrat. I, I, I do wish there was no political parties. Um, with that being said, I hope we can approach our next meeting with more civility, some more solutions, and a little bit more cohesiveness. Um, I do not like the political tone And um, one thing I'm just gonna end with, we lost four community members or three community members in the last month. Life is not guaranteed. And none of us wanna leave this life angry over a volunteer position or feeling stressed. Let's work together, let's figure it out. But stop placing the blame, please stop placing the blame and just let's try to fix it and move forward. Not every answer is the right answer, but every answer or suggestion is considered. That's all I have to say. Um, also, I'm, I think with our agenda, I'm going to have to make a motion to extend our time. Second. Yeah. Never mind. Just read something. I, Kathy, do I have to make a motion to suspend the rules or? Or do I just have to make a motion to extend past 1030? Yeah. Is there a time limit past the 1030? <laughs> if we're staying, you're staying. No, I'm just kidding. Um, can I make a motion to extend our board meeting time past 1030? So moved. Seconded. 
Is it a roll call or hand? Uh, let's do a roll call vote. First by Mr. Ryder, seconded by Mr. Hamry. Okay. Mrs. Acree? Yes. Dr. Cowlin? Yes. Mrs. Cushman? Yes. Mr. Hamry? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. Mrs. Pickett? Yes. yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Mr. Ungeyer? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. yes. Okay, moving right along, um, unfinished business, uh, Board of Ed policy adoption and policy revisions. Policy members met on April 19th and reviewed several policies from CABE. <laughs> I've actually never read the minutes. I, I just go over it. Um, so you saw the policy revisions in your packet. Uh, 14118.232, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Drug-Free Workplace. That is uh, 4,000 series, as a reminder, is related to staff. Scott, we're just doing second reading. Oh. Second reading. So the way to graded system and distance education. And then first reading will be another agenda. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. That's why I don't read this. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I never read the script. I just know what we do because I keep track. Um, 61726, correct? Yep. All right. That's the distance education remote online courses. Second reading. We spoke about this at our last meeting uh, where we were bringing the board up to speed on the fact that there were some courses that were available online, but weren't available to us, and we wanted to make this more accessible to our students. Um, so now there'll be a, a wider range of availability for online courses that don't have to be specifically brick and mortar courses. We can have a greater menu of items and that um, we'd also make those available to our students and that we agreed to do such and that passed first reading. The second was uh, 614611, the weighted grade system. And again, that was clarifying our weighted grade system based on um, some updates. Those are both included in your packet, both passed first reading. So we are up for a second reading on that. So I would like to ask for a motion to, ex oh, sorry, open for discussion. Any discussion? Okay, sensing none. Um, this is roll call. No, you have to make a yeah, I would like to make a motion to uh, pass second reading six one seven two point six regarding distance education and six one four six point one one the weighted grade system. So moved. Thank you. Second. And now roll call. Mrs. Acree. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Kalnan. Yes. Mrs. Cushman. Yes. Mr. Hamry? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. Mrs. Pickett? Yes. yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Mr. Ungeyer? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Motion passes. <clears throat> New business, approval of school readiness grant. Madam Chair, that's the grant that uh, Amy and Leanne were here earlier. Um, board would need to take action on this, and the council is planning on taking action on May 2nd. Okay, let me get there. Okay, do I have a motion to accept the school readiness grant application as presented? So moved. Second. First by uh, Dr. Kalnan, seconded by Mr. Hamry. Any discussion? Roll, Roll call. call. Mrs. Acree? Yes. Dr. Kalman? Yes. Mrs. Cushman? Yes. Mr. Hamry? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. Mrs. Pickett? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Ryder? Uh, also, yes. Mr. Ongeyer? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Motion passes. Next item, approval of the fiscal year 2022 Head Start grant. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, Director of Early Childhood Initiatives, Jacqueline Valley is looking for the board's endorsement of a grant we're applying for for our Head Start program with the Office of Early Childhood Education. Grant serves 102 children in our Enfield Head Start. They're enclosed in your packet. This Friday was a memo um, with regards to the state grant um, and all the information that coincides with that. Thank you. Do I have a motion to accept? So moved. First by Dr. Kalman, seconded Second. by Josh. Josh Mr. Hamry. Discussion? Does anyone have any questions, discussions on that item? 
Sensing none, roll call. Mrs. Zakri? Yes. Dr. Kalnan? Yes. Mrs. Cushman? Yes. Mr. Hamry? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. Mrs. Pickett? Big yes. Yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Mr. Ungeyer? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Motion passes. Item C, BOE policy adoptions and revision first reading. Now, <laughs> this is the second one. I was reading this page first. Uh, policy committee members met on April 19th, reviewed several policies from CABE. They are recommending changes to two of our existing policies, 4118.232, and again, the 4000s is related to personnel matters. Uh, it's a revision and an update regarding alcohol, tobacco, and a drug-free workplace, as well as 5131.911, bullying, teen dating violence prevention and intervention. Uh, we've also reviewed two additional policies uh, that Mr. Lungi brought to our attention. Uh, one was regarding the non-lapsing education fund. Uh, that specifically, to bring that to everybody's attention, is we were always allowed to carry 1% over from year to year, and then recently it changed to two. We wanted to make sure that we had a policy that clarified that we can carry over up to 2%. Uh, that was not something that was a policy previously in our records, although we have been doing it because it is law. And I thought that with the turnover, the potential turnover for any board of ed or town council, as we only serve 24 months at a time, it'd be good to have that clarified for people in the future. Uh, the, uh, the other uh, new policy that we discussed was 6140 regarding curriculum. Um, those were all included into your packets. Uh, so I'd like to make a motion to, I'm oh, sorry, discussion. No, you have to make a motion. Make a motion to approve the first reading of 4118.232, and 6140. So moved. Second. Any discussions? Oh, I have to put my mic on. Any it's getting late. Any discussions? Sensing none, roll call, Kathy. This is a Cree. Yes. Dr. Kalnan? Yes. Mrs. Cushman? Yes. Mr. Hamry? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. Mrs. Pickett? Yes. yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Mr. Ungeyer? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Motion passes. Item, dis item D, discussion and action, if any, regarding the formation of the Pizza Consent Assignment Task Force. Mr. Ungeyer, I'll lead with you. Okay, well, I'd like to make a motion that this board that we form a committee that will address specifically to start with anyway that we could start the uh, um, to look at uh, the root cause of the pizza consent assignment and that this committee would make recommendations to the administration um, for corrective actions or uh, said in another way uh, make recommendations to the administration that would help to prevent um, um, quote mistakes from from reoccurring I've, uh, yes, I'll, I'll wait for discussion. Yeah. Do I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Ms. Cushman, second by Ms. Cree. Discussion? Yeah, um, I've, I guess I've made my discussion, I guess, in my board member comments. So I've, uh, rather than discuss it right now, what I had to say about it and, and my support of it, um, uh, was really all said at the at the board member comments. So I have nothing additional to say beyond that. Mr. Ryder. Okay, so I have a couple of points. Um, so I think a committee that increases the opportunity for parental engagement and parental feedback is a positive. And I am going to let Amanda speak to that as she'll go up next. Um, a quote unquote task force is not what is needed. Um, so I thank you for changing the name, but it is on the agenda as task force because that's how it was presented to us. So we were using your language. Um, during Mr. Ungeyer's own presentation, he said that this would be a one-time task force to find an escape on this one issue. So again, if that one issue is uh, sorted out, if it hasn't been sorted out to his satisfaction, um, although the superintendent has spoken to this and we've, and we've spoken to this as well, um, then 
it would it would open and close with this one thing anyway. Um, so, um, because you said it was specific to this one assignment, you also said that this is not partisan, which is not true. Um, you also presented it to the board on screen and never emailed it to us, so nobody had a chance to review it. You were offered feedback from Mrs. Pickett, and you did not incorporate that feedback or respond to her email. Um, so whether this is John's plan or a plan that John was emailed by a friend, um, again, this is John's idea only. Uh, he has shared it with his caucus. He has shared it with certain members of his political party or people that he is, you know, affiliated with. But the board has never seen this. Um, so this is John's and only John's idea. So the fact that the public's been coming up and speaking to this for a couple of meetings now saying, I think John's idea is great. You guys should hear him out. You hadn't even heard it yet because John didn't put it up on our screens until the next meeting. So, like, I don't know how everybody heard this idea before we did. Um, so now it's a committee, not a task force, which is, again, great. Um, somebody spoke today about this, saying that it's a proven thing from a big tech company. So that that's good. Um, also heard a lot of hearsay, a lot of a lot of hearsay testimony regarding this. Um, so yeah, I, I see no reason for a specific pizza task force, and I would ask Ms. Pickett to share with us her idea for increasing and improving parental engagement um, that isn't so hyper-focused on one escape. Thank you. Ms. Pickett. Thank you. Um, thank you, Scott, because I'm just going to reiterate many of the same um, points. Um, so a couple things. One, that this has not been ignored. Um, it, the pizza debacle um, has been addressed by our superintendent. I have spoken on it. I will clarify that um, health education in eighth grade is an opt out. I might have said opt in accidentally or in the heat of uh you know, emotional meetings, um, it is an opt out. So you get a permission slip. If you do not want your student to participate, you fill that out and your student no longer doesn't participate in that class. Um, we know what this is about. Um, so I, I just don't find, especially with all of the FOI findings, that this is not what's in best interest of our kids. So instead, like what Mr. Ryder um, shared, I would like to formally ask the chair and superintendent to explore forming a permanent Stakeholder Advisory Committee. I mentioned this last meeting, so um, for all those who said nothing else has been proposed, um, I spoke of this last meeting, so I'm going to formally ask um, you, Mr. Dresic and Tina, to see. Um, I'd be more than happy to do a presentation on the purpose and membership of this group, um, but I, I will reiterate what I've already said. The purpose would be to connect learning to home and home to learning. This would provide a venue for partnership, feedback, transparency, awareness, and decision making. This would be a stakeholder group of more than just parents, but students, staff, families, and community liaisons could be part of setting goals for our district and action planning, providing feedback on proposed policy, um, assist the curriculum committee with tasks like reimagining TAG or giving feedback on course progressions or on how to share assessments with families, curriculum, learning tasks. And I'm sure there are other ways that I haven't immediately thought of. But this committee would be formed to assist the district with positive change moving forward and would not be a root cause analysis of an assignment that were very clear um, on, on the issues around that. So that is what I'm proposing and that is what I would like to formally either present or whatever next steps I need to do. Um, but I, I am full, fully um, supportive of family engagement and family partnership um, in constructive and helpful ways to our district. Um, and I propose a more permanent stakeholder advisory committee. Mr. Hamry. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I was here for the uh, presentation that we had virtually, and um, I, if I recall correctly, and maybe I don't, it's been a very uh, time-consuming week that I've had. So I apologize if I've not seen it or if it uh, just something I'm imagining, but I thought we were supposed to be receiving the presentation to review. I don't recall receiving that at all. 
So I have to go by my recollection of what I saw looking over my shoulder during that uh, presentation. Um, and if I recall again, Mr. Ungar, the, the text of the slides was written in very small font on certain slides, which is neither here nor there, but um, not being able to recall the specific details of the uh, presentation, um, I'm going to go with what I can what I can recall, and what is uh, referenced in the information that was provided through the FOI discussion. We we were uh, that we heard earlier. Um, this this is, is not necessary. We are in a situation that uh, has been allowed to um, progress from a administrative perspective as it's supposed to and had it, it's been addressed at that in that proper channel in the proper channels um, the the, th the thought that we as a board would want to promote um, the investigation of something that was administratively handled as it should have been is to acknowledge that um, we, we don't trust the process that we are here to uh, follow when there is a disciplinary action with a staff member. Um, we are that, that process. We are the people that determine what happens in the process of a disciplinary action for a staff member. And that process only gets to us when it's necessary. And in this case, it wasn't necessary because it had been resolved long before it became clear to me that we had an issue to discuss. To that point, I learned about this issue because it came to us through a board member. I did not hear about it anywhere else uh, until it was discussed by a board member, which in my view means that it was disseminated somewhere else outside of our as a board, outside our purview, and process and, and uh, procedure was set in place at that time without a discussion of the board in a disciplinary role addressing a staff member. We went outside our scope with that, and that's not right. Um, to the point of a, a, the, a, uh, the issue itself, no one agrees that it was acceptable. There's no disagreement about that at all. Um, to the timing of everything, I think the email chain that uh, has been showing up has, has proven the timing of everything. I, and I want to point out that, as Chair mentioned earlier, this is a board that's been in place six months, calendar months. So we are a quarter of the way through this term by the calendar and this assignment was developed under curriculum that was reviewed by the previous term so i'm a simple person i am i'm a very simple person you know where where was the oversight at that point i don't know but what I do know is that it was developed under the previous term and approved under the previous term in, in some way, shape, or form. Where was the task force at that point? Where was the discussion and the rallying and the battle cries and the offending com communications at that point? Why wasn't it discussed then? So having said that, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to this point. I appreciate the patience of everybody listening. Nothing further. Dr. Kelman? Uh, well, I think if this had been a, a pattern of behavior, I would have been much more concerned. But I think it was an isolated event, an event that was more than adequately discussed by our superintendent together with the solution to the problem. So the issue was raised and answered. And I just don't th think that there's much of a point to be served in beating a dead horse. So uh, that's all I have to say. Ms. Cushman? I, 
think that overall what's most alarming is not that this assignment was mistakenly posted, but really that these types of assignments are even available to our children. And so the concern that I sense even for myself is if this is what is out there, how can we protect more from coming? So it might be just this one isolated thing, but when we look at what else is possible that could be presented to our students, that is cause for some alarm. So just, is there, okay. Um, because when we look at the big picture of what's happening countrywide, we have to ask ourselves, what's happening with, you know, is there some type of fundamental link between the pornography addiction amongst youth, amongst our youth? Is there a rate between the number of our youth, American-born youth, that are being trafficked? You know, the students that are being exploited because they're being introduced to its topics in the classroom that seems safe. And yet then online, they're encountering opportunities to have these same discussions with what turns out to be strangers. And so we have our students that are vulnerable because of what they're being introduced to. And then we look at how in, there's about 13 states, I believe, that have pending legislation that have been proposed to um, lower the age of consent to 14, which is really just legalizing pedophilia. And so we just look at, there's a lot of concern in the community because there's a lot of concern about what else could the door be open to. So I just think, you know, we have some community members that brought questions that I think were good questions. And we may feel like we've answered them, but they're still out there. And we can tell by some of the questions that maybe there's some confusion, some things that haven't been answered. I, as a board member, have questions I don't feel like have been answered. So I just, I see this task force or this, you know, as an opportunity, this committee, to have questions answered so that our community um, will feel more at peace about what is possible to come out. Madam Chair. Oh, Mr. Ryder. <laughs> um, so again, John's one-time pizza task force will not solve your concerns, but Amanda's all-encompassing permanent parental, what's the word? <laughs> Sorry, uh, stakeholder. I got to get it up now. I'm not sure. <laughs> stakeholder, I am sure. Stakeholder uh, engagement. Committee. Thank you. And we don't have advisory a presentation. Advisory committee, sorry. sorry. Stakeholder advisory, advisory committee. committee. Right. And to be clear, we don't have a presentation on that to share with anybody, but Amanda's working on something. Um, John made a presentation that he won't share with us. Oh, no, um, no, no. Don't say that, Scott. John, I would be happy to share you made a you. presentation that you did not share with us. This was a month ago when you were in Houston and did it on virtually, and you have not shared it. And your your words, you Listen, said, I'm not trying to hide this it. is a one-time task force to get to the root cause and to find the escape regarding the pizza assignment where, period. Where, where in what I read here said it's a one-time task force? That's what you told us oh. when you spoke to us when? online. When you when? when you talked to us online at the last meeting. Scott, I read the I regardless read, I read to your, you tonight. Hold on. I read to one you at tonight. a time. Excuse Mr. Ungeyer, let yes. him finish okay. and then you can finish and then I have something to say about that. Your one time pizza task force will not solve a future problem. And if you want an encompassing committee to address some of these concerns, this is where future things could be discussed, would be from Amanda's idea and the root cause escapism project proven by big tech companies for a one off that's already happened, won't fix that. Thank you. Mr. Ongar. Did you have something to say, Tina? I, I can say it after. You can go ahead and say what you have to say. I was just, yeah, I, no, go ahead. It's fine. I yeah, know. So yeah, this, you know, I read this thing here tonight. I wrote this thing today. And uh, the last several days I wrote this. And uh, uh, nowhere in here do I say, oh, this is a one-time thing. We saw That's this. what you said. I promoted it. Scott, you have to let him finish. Let him finish. Well, he's telling you what he read today. It's okay. Scott. Let him talk. Listen, I, when I proposed this, even, even when I was away and gave the presentation, I said I could see this 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 effort evolving into addressing many issues that face our school system. Now, maybe you didn't hear that. 
okay? But I did say it, okay? So, um, and you, and um, so, am I to understand, I want to be sure that you go on record, and I want to be sure I understand this, that you will not address, you will not address, and Amanda, what you're, what you're proposing, will not address specifically the, quote, mistake of the pizza task, uh, the, p the pizza consent form assignment. So, John, I, I'm going to say no, it won't specifically be about the pizza assignment. However, many questions that were raised, I want to, like, I want families who have been coming and seeking to be heard in this. I understand wanting to better understand what is the curriculum writing process, how do lessons, you know, get to teachers, um, how can families access those lessons. Those are all reasonable questions to have. Um, and, and I could see conversations, conversations around how do we share curriculum, curriculum, how do we um, um, let families know, know what learning is happening in the classroom more openly. openly. All, All of those conversations, conversations I think, that happen. But, but just, just a task force or just a committee, just a committee around, around the, the eighth grade uh, uh, consent, consent assignment, assignment um, to um, me is inappropriate. Yeah, I didn't present it that way. So that's being misrepresented by Scott by saying that. And I didn't represent it that no, way. No, I would disagree. I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm take making a, my comments I'll tell you what. When you, I have a I whole slide that says this thing will evolve into something else. Let's okay. see it. Did you see the whole slide? You didn't share it with us We're for the 10th time. <laughs> We're not going to argue. I'm going to interject We're myself here. We're here and you saw it. I'm going to interject myself okay, here. please. The way I understood it is that we were creating this task force to find the root cause of the pizza assignment. Yes. Then we would move forward with a potential, we would evolve that out after the root cause of the pizza yes. assignment. Yes, addressing other, other things. Right. So this wasn't presented as a one time only, that's it, see you later, goodbye. No, it was to address the most important and the most concerning item uh, today which is being sure that something like the release of this assignment doesn't happen again, but we could put in corrective action to be sure that it doesn't happen again, okay? And there's ways to do that. Um, and that it would evolve into something bigger and even better, okay? And that was the intent. Um, and so, um, do good doctor here, you said something about, well, this is a, a one-time thing. It's, listen, back in October, there was another lesson, which, which is what got so many people involved here. And that lesson was this social identity wheel that parents objected to. It brought many of them here. And again, this is where, you know, the superintendent addressed it. And he said, you know, policies that we adopt, you know, these kinds of things that we're responsible for it. And, and so I felt, well, okay, fine. This was a one-off happening thing. I'm sure the administration will take care of it. You know, these, these um, mistakes won't happen again. And what happens? It happens again. Okay, it happened again with the pizza, the pizza consent assignment. So it wasn't the one-off. Now we're at a two-off. What, what is it, three strikes maybe, four? I, I don't know. But what I'm saying, what I'm suggesting, what I did suggest, and it's clear, it's clear to me that, you know, I'm not going to change your mind, okay? So um, if you don't think this is important, then I want you to go on record and say, I don't think this is important. I don't think it's important that we address the, uh, the, the, the pizza assignment, okay? Tell our community that you don't think it's worthy of us taking a closer look at it. I'd like you to say that to our community. No, I'm not going to take a closer look at it, okay? That's fine. And you're going to be accountable to the very people that put you in these responsible positions. And that's good. I think what you, I, I think what I don't like about that statement is the word you used. It's not that they, they don't like it, but they think there is a better use of resources because it comes down to understanding the curriculum. And that's what Amanda's trying to accomplish. Why are things taught? Where do they come from? I don't disagree. Why aren't we mandated? But I, I do want to circle back. Okay. I was here in October when that, it, was, it wasn't part of a health assignment. It was a social civic mm -hmm. mini lesson. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dresick, did you want to say something to that? Or? I think that's what you're going with. 
You just said what I, what I was going to. It was it wasn't part of a health assignment. It was part of a social civic lesson. True. It was. OK. Um, I don't feel that that was. Can my memory serve me correctly? Who was on the board with me? Was that identified as a mistake? It was ignored. Mr. Sorry. Flaherty. It was ignored. That's why we're here. As you were, please. Can you remind me of the discussion we had regarding that? Ms. Pickett, go ahead. I was going to say what I remember from that discussion is that, like, hey, maybe there could be some adjustments and we could look into how some of the categories folks were uncomfortable with. Um, but I don't ever remember it being like this is a blatant mistake and should not have happened, but understanding that some people might be uncomfortable with some of the categories that were on the wheel. Thank you. That's how I remember it. Mr. LeBlanc? All right. So, what I, what I, what I find, what I find between all this is, oddly enough, some kind of common ground that's there, in a in a cloud somewhere in the universe. Um, well, I, and I, I thank you for brainstorming this idea, um, because I think it's generating um, conversation that's going to lead to a place where we need to be. Um, but before it has my support, I need, personally, I want to see a more concrete vision of what we're going to do. Um, there's, a, Amanda may present a slide, you presented a slide, that's, that's not, and Amanda, I, I don't mean to jump the gun if you are or you aren't, but if she presents something that's not concrete either, I think we need to come together as a board, maybe in leadership, maybe iron some of this out on, um, and take ideas from both combine it, and I'd like to see a multi-pronged approach where we could get answers. So I look at the board committee reports, and there's one, two, three, four, five, eight, eight or nine of them on here. I think um, certain issues could be addressed in this committee that touch on all those. And I think mm -hmm. on item 12, in the near future, there's going to be a committee that would have my support where we have a line item um with a with a committee i'm not i'm not saying i agree or disagree with names some kind of committee um where we do look at a multi-pronged approach where people may have issues with policy what do we do about policy um or curriculum right curriculum would be tied into that maybe we could ask some questions about particular assignments that that people want answers to i i do think though we have to be careful about this and it needs to be a little more thought out and that's why i use the word concrete because we have to understand as a board what we can and can't do there's there's state laws and and some things were mandated under um and also yeah i'm not gonna lie i'm i'm a i'm a little concerned and i don't want it to become a topic where our teachers feel like they're under a microscope either with any kind of committee. Yes, they have the right to be questioned. Yes, parents have the right to know what the education, what education and lessons are being taught in the classroom. But it's a very, it's a very fine line. And I think we have to have an understanding of what that is before we have any decisions made or a vote in support or against any committee, um, regardless who presents it. So I'm just going to go back to using the word. My main, my main um, message tonight is I want from this board, all nine of us, a more concrete idea. Uh, not e not uh, Scratch the word idea. I don't want it to be an idea. I want it to be a concrete foundation of what this committee is before we actually vote to support it. Once that's created, it has my support to be added to agenda item number 12, where I do believe there will be a committee there that due to your brainstorming and other ideas that conversation has come up through, um, we'll have a committee there. So, okay, so, I, so I have I'll a, tell you what I'm going to do. Well, no, I have a question. Um, and then I'm going to go to Mr. Ryder because he has another question. So if this, I guess, what is the outcome? What, what is the outcome? So this, this task force get approved, gets approved and we find out that this curriculum was available from the state, 
and the wrong piece of it was grabbed. And what what is your solution? It's not my solution. Excuse me. Excuse me. That's the point. That's the point of this. It's it's not my solution. It's the committee's solution. OK, I'm one set of eyes when you have a group of people. OK, from a variety of different uh, um, backgrounds together. OK, they view things differently and they come up with creative ideas and creative solutions. This is why you you uh, you employ them to look at things and you provide them with tools. That's why at the last meeting I put together a presentation that had a tool and that's all it was. It was a tool that was proven to be effective. OK, and it's used throughout industry. And it's applicable in a variety of different settings as being as 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 a, as a proven methodology for learning and uh, and deducing um, the source of, of of these types of things. Right. So, so I'm saying, well, what so, if it is? What if it was human error? So wh wh I mean, it was human error. So it's human error. What? What can we as a board, we cannot get not, involved not in us personnel as a board, issues. But what they can do is they can make recommendations like that checklist, okay? And this is just one example, okay? Like that checklist where you say, okay, when you have, say, lessons of this nature, then rather than just let them go, you have a checklist that you go through and say, okay, I can't put this out on the web until I have a, an, um, a, an approval sheet from an apparent. OK, and you, you be sure that all those checks are in the boxes before those things happen. It's 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 exactly like the checklist that you would have when you're going to when you're going to go through the airplane. You're going to say, OK, um, you know, I got to be sure that all of these things are met before I do these things. That's just one example that I can think of. All right. But you've 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 created a process that needs to be satisfied before these things can be released to our kids. And, and, and it could be that they say, okay, um, when you're dealing with, say, sexually related things or other things, okay, then it, then it falls into that category. Like okay? we're, a permission but we're, Well, I was going to say, but we're assuming, there, but there's an assumption that there is no process for down, no, downloading but, but, that. Let but, me it, finish. but it got out. There's an assumption that there is no process. Um, no, it's, it's, there's not an assumption that there is no process, but a mistake was made. Right. Okay? And we can't afford to make mistakes. So we have to take a look at what broke down in the process that allowed the mistake to be made. That's, that's, I, that's I guess what I'm really saying what, is, I feel like that's what the, the central office and administration is for, to identify that. You know, we as board members, develop policy. We, we have curriculum committees where we approve courses, but we don't oversee curriculum as board members. No, this is an opportunity to, to engage our, okay. So Scott, go ahead. I didn't, I, I wasn't copied on your email to Kathy where you corrected the minutes because if you read the minutes from the last meeting, Mr. Ungeyer, he, he feels it is prudent for the board to initiate the formation of a task force specific to pizza consent, because that's what you said to us through your Zoom connection uh, when you met with us virtually and presented a slideshow that you still have not presented to us. So I would move to close discussion so we can vote specifically on the pizza consent assignment task force. And the fact that you're asking us to approve something that you didn't share with us. I did share it with you. I'm not, I am. Send us a copy. It Scott, is you turn. saw it. I, I, it, was on, it was on that TV, that TV, that TV. You had every opportunity to see my presentation. I didn't withhold the presentation from you. Jonathan. And if you think that's. Jonathan, are you I had serious? To, John, I had to sit here at a, like a point four font. And my eyes are not the greatest in the world, clearly. So if you wanted this to be re even perceived as bipartisan, you should have shared it with the nine of us. That is a ridiculous statement. There is no proposal that has been shared with us other than something that you said. No, I Zoom. I agree. You shared Scott, with us I, as a PowerPoint. I agree you that I did not forward the PowerPoint to you. And you feel it is prudent for the board to initiate the formation of a task force specific to pizza consent. It's in the minutes that we're about to approve. So I hope you either abstain from those minutes or vote them down because that's what the words say. But if you, if because you, if everybody you, had Scott, the same impression, we 
had. Did you see the presentation? No. No, did, Scott, did you Hold see on, the presentation? No, no, I, I'm asking. I won't have you back. Question. We do not have to have you back. Don't worry. This. Did you, you see the presentation? Excuse me. Hold did you on. see the Both presentation? Of you let no, the door not, close before have, we continue. I have no copy of the okay. presentation to Scott, review. Scott, take a minute. Mr. Ungayer, take a minute. Mr. LeBlanc. All right, before that, let me, let me backtrack a minute. I think the conversation that you and Madam Chair just had mm -hmm. would have been a perfect discussion for that committee that yeah, we sure could potentially create. That's a copy of your proposal. And that's, that's, not where I'm, that's not where I'm going with it either, but that would have been a creative, um, thought out discussion that, that could have happened within the committee. And I think we're discussing it here, <laughs> but if we just have that, if we figure out what this committee is and fast forward, that would have been a conversation for that committee. Well, I, and I think I'll tell you, I'll tell you right now, the, what's on the agenda is, um, I, I tell you, what, I made a, I made a proposal for the formation of a, of a of a of what says here a pizza consent assignment task, a task force. force. So I'll tell you this, um, I'm going to table it. I'm going to withdraw my my motion here. I'm going to table it, and 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 that's it. Now Amanda Pickett doesn't have a um, an agenda item. Okay, there's no agenda item. No, on here. what we oh, would right. do is table it and then I'm tabling it. Right, but what I'm saying is if she would have to go through the same process, Mr. Ungeyer, if she wanted to yeah. create something, she could create something and then we could, um, she could present it during her board member comments or, and, or add it to the agenda. Um, That's fine, but she's already said it is not going to address the pizza assignment, the release, the mistake and the release of the pizza assignment. And so you made that very clear to me and you've made that very clear to our community. Thank you very much. I think that... All right. I think that we have to, to read. Yeah, I'm going to start wrapping up this discussion, but I don't think we should accuse people of not caring about the community because the community is divided on this and there's a community that supports it. There's a community that doesn't. And there's the community in the middle that Mr. LeBlanc talked about. Go ahead, Amanda. Thank you. And so I, I, you know, John, it, this isn't about an argument between my committee and your committee. Um, I think we sit here to think of what's in best interest of students, families, and staff of MTO Public School. So what I'm proposing is not just about the pizza assignment because, yes, you're hearing families who are concerned about the pizza assignment. I'm not saying that they don't have valid concerns. However, we have had families come with multitude of concerns. I have sat there as a parent with concerns that no task force or no committee was ever formed to address my concerns. So I think how we make a committee, and even if it's a one time, we start with the pizza assignment off of an issue, like how do we decide that was the issue we were gonna do it for? And the reason that I'm concerned about it is because obviously through emails that have been released, it's about health and sex, it's about race, it's about SEL, it's about our LGBTQ students, there's specific topics that want to be addressed by your committee that is not about Enfield Public Schools as a whole. So I will save a formal presentation um, and we can talk about a stakeholder advisory committee that will address many of the concerns that um, multitude of families have asked about around how curriculum is selected, how are parents informed, what do we do if something happens. Um, I think those are all valid questions and I have no problem with addressing those in a formalized um, process, but not about a pizza assignment only. Um, I'm going to go to Mr. Hamry, Mr. LeBlanc, and we're ending the discussion. I'm going to add a few things and then we're done. Just, we're moving on. This is more of an administrative question. We had a, Mr. Ryder had said, had said the words, I'd like to make a motion. I'm not sure if that still stands, if there's anything that is going along with that. Can I get a clarification? Please? And excuse me. Thank you. And then the tabling, to table the comment, is this a, do we vote on either of these? Are these actionable statements? I believe we have to vote to table it. Was and I apologize, I couldn't. I don't recall if there was a motion and a second to get you to this. Yes, discussion. there was, or was no, there? No, there? There was a. There, Mr. Ryder said the word. I'd like to make the motion, and I don't know if there was any. Nothing that came from that. Okay, I don't thank believe you. there was a second, so you would. I, I just want to get that clarified because I got a little lost in that conversation. Thank you, okay, Mr. LeBlanc. Do you have anything to add? I do. Um, and with all due respect, Ms. Pickett, if, if this does go on 
if you come up with a presentation and it does go on the agenda because of the the reasons I laid out earlier, and I don't know how it would be put on the agenda, but that would not have my support that evening either. I think it needs to come from the nine of us. If it took nine presentations to get through, and if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. But I want it to come from the entirety of a nine member board. So this one does not have my support as written on the agenda tonight, nor would yours if it was worded in or up for a vote to form your task in a, in a next meeting. I'd be eager to hear what you have to present as I was John, and I think it needs to be brought back and, and then brought forward again. Thank you. Okay, to end, if I can make a couple of suggestions. We have fair representation across all of our committees. We have um, all of us are on our curriculum committee, all of us are on our policy committee. I think in order for us to have a committee that is gonna be successful, you also have to loop in your policy and your curriculum committee and make sure you have fair representation. I think what I see at the end of the day is this all goes back to the state mandates and the state curriculum and what we are mandated to teach for health and, and different things like that. Um, I think that we all have a certain way that we wanna see what is taught. And I think, you know, we do have a community of, um, divided on this, but I think there's a, a, a correct way to go about this where we can really make everybody feel comfortable and feel together as a community. But we also have these other committees that we can pull from uh, regarding policies, regarding curriculum. We are not curriculum writers. We are not versed in it. We don't know the state mandates. Um, we are not schooled in it. Um, so we do have to defer to the educational leaders to help with this. I'm sorry if, if, if you feel differently, but we have educational leaders in this district that we employ to work on this. And we do have to defer to them. I am not opposed to any parent asking about curriculum. Every parent has a right to ask about the curriculum. Um, and and I, we have parents that ask. You have that right as a parent. Um, and, and I wanna stress that. So, um, Kathy, we're gonna go ahead and table this. Do we have to make a motion to table it or do we just, okay. Can I make a motion to table the formation of the Pizza Consent Assignment Task Force? I'll second. Roll call or? Thank you. Okay. This is a Yes. Dr. Yes. Mrs. Yes. Mr. Yep. Mr. Yes. 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 Normally we'll say table to when to the next meeting or Indefinitely. I would say indefinitely. indefinitely. Do we vote on them indefinitely or no? <laughs> that was a joke? We'll just, right now we'll just table it in indefinitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next item is item E, discussion and action, if any, regarding COVID premium pay for EPS staff. Um, Mr. Dresick, I believe we received 670 so ish thousand from the town council? Yes, 637, uh, 637, 731. And neither the Board of Ed or the town council continues to have that in their budget, correct? Uh, no, that was appropriated to the board um, as part of the MBR requirement. So, was, so essentially we had gotten a flat funding, and this has happened multiple years, this isn't anything new, um, until the state adopted their budget and then established what the MBR would be. And then the council did back on March 21st, did a supplemental appropriation because our original funding was at, was flat funded, but through the MBR, they had to make an additional appropriation to us. Because it didn't come until March, it is not a, in, included in our budget because we have to do that in July. And therefore we can't appropriate money for it or expend money because we don't physically have it. So that was a long answer, but yes, no one's accounted for. It's, it's in our coffers now, but it's not accounted for. Okay, so if we could, we would be able to use that for a stipend across the district 
like it would it would go through every um, every employee essentially. If the board wishes to do that, yes. So if we were to say give every every employee a stipend of a thousand dollars, where would that additional money come from? So typically, as you know, we have about a seventy-two million dollar budget. And at the end of every year, Dr. Callen, you'll learn this, we have fun, we do have some funds left over at the end of the year, depending upon things that aren't accounted for throughout the year, such as staff leaving. Um, one of the items we've had the last two years has been, we have money budgeted for substitutes, but you know there's a substitute shortage. So there's been, the board has achieved some savings through there, although I'd rather have the coverage. Um, so there is funding at the end of the year that typically is in that 200 to five, I say $400,000 range, because. Last year, as you recall, the board actually, we, the last few years we've been returning the funds to the town. Last year, the board returned $400,000 to the town to help go toward the replacement of the field at Enfield High School. So there, there, there will be, we anticipate there being about two hundred fifty dollars to $300,000 at the end of this year on unspended funds. And that would cover um, every employee of Enfield Public Schools? That would, based on your suggestion, that would cost in the ballpark area of $900,000, give or take. Um, and we would have the appropriate funding to do that if the board, board so wished to do that. And then I know the town had, from what I understand, they had um, criteria on how they figured out if um, people had left or different things like that. Yeah, I don't know the exact criteria because we haven't done it here, but I we can certainly, I've had a conversation with the manager that if it was presented to the board that we would, we would request their criteria for that as well. But I, I believe there was certain amount of criteria that had to be met, such as you had to be an employee during the COVID period, you couldn't have left and things like that. But I, I will clarify that if that's the will of the board. I think we have to make a motion and then discuss it. Yep. Okay. Okay, um, I'll make a motion um, regarding COVID premium pay for EPS staff in the amount of $1,000. Second. Seconded by Mr. Hamry. Discussion? Mr. Ryder? So this goes back to March 12th, 13th, two years ago, when we closed our buildings, but we did not close our schools. And the fact that we closed our buildings, but never closed our learning, and our teachers who worked through COVID, and then they came back and they did double duty, and <laughs> our secretaries and our nurses, and this, all EPS employees, I don't wanna to speak to teachers. Is that correct in your proposal? Yeah. And if that, is, if that is something that we can do with these funds, then that is what I stand behind, is our staff and those people that got us through the last two years in our buildings and that are still struggling to get through some of the mental and, and, and emotional problems as well as some of the behavioral issues that we're seeing. And um, I, I definitely support this for our staff. Thank you. Oh, and Smith, our bus drivers, they have a program in place, something similar? Yeah, I, I, we actually have an agreement already with Smith Bus. Remember, we yes. recall we had a crisis on our hands at the beginning of the year about retaining bus drivers. Um, so our agreement is with Smith. So the specifics of what the criteria is for a driver is left up to Smith bus because they're a private entity. Our agreement with Smith was anyone that meets their, that criteria would be in receipt of $1,000 at the conclusion of the school year. So Excellent. that would be consistent with- I just wanted to make sure because they're, they're part of our family as well. Yes, that's actually already established. Good. And that was done Thank in public uh, back in the fall. I wanted them to know. <laughs> Is your hand up? Yes. Okay, Mr. LeBlanc. Um, so as like many uh, private companies did, um, they too offer their employees bonuses or um, stipends, and I feel like that's our duty as um, the entity over over um, the workforce in uh, the Enfield Public School System. Um, so it has my support. I wouldn't mind at the end of the day seeing, you know, what the criteria was or what that, that list incorporates. Um, I think that's re a reasonable ask, um, but it, it does have my support. Mr. Hamry. Um, I agree with Jonathan that uh, I, these, uh, these, these folks deserve to be 
acknowledged for the, the work that they've put in. Um, I trust the numbers, and that's my w one of my biggest concerns is that uh, as long as we have the money, cool. Uh, is If we can give them as much as we can afford to give them, all the better. Uh, my question, though, uh, it'd be how quickly can this turn around? What is the process? And uh, I know it would affect them in, in the ability to plan like for a vacation, for example. So, <laughs> if it's an unfair question, no, it, it, no, it's a, it's a legitimate question. Um, obviously, this has been discussed because it had happened. We, the, the Madam Chair, and I got this question at a at our budget presentation um, to the council. So, obviously, this is not something that we're unaware that the discussion's out there. Um, I will warn you that if we are going to follow the same procedure that the town, the one thing I am aware that the town distributed the funds was through payroll. Um, and obviously that would be taxable income because that's, you know, how the government works. Um, my payroll person, of which is a person of one, doesn't know this is happening right now. So <laughs> I'm not comfortable. Um, Kathy back me up on this when she attacks me tomorrow. Um, she's awesome, by the way, and you've all know her and she's, she will do anything. But I, to be fair to her. Uh, would ask um, and and that's pretty much why I'm asking too. Like, it, or w I want the staff. Yeah, to it's not going to be there tomorrow if you vote on this. <laughs> and to be quite frank, um, we are having discussions now um, with some of our collective bargaining uh, units because our 12 month employees um, by contract we pay 12 month employees 26 pay periods. That's right. all negotiated in within their agreement. Every now and then we get a weird year where your last paycheck in June. It doesn't line up in a cycle of two weeks for that first paycheck in July. So right now, what conventional wisdom would say was, well, we'll just move it to 27. A, that makes your weekly pay or biweekly paycheck smaller. And B, I legally can't do that because the collective bargaining agreement says 26 pays. So we do have a contingency of employees, some of which have made it very clear that they do work paycheck to paycheck. Um, that is the possibility that they may have to go three weeks as opposed to their normal two weeks. And for anybody who has direct deposits and direct mortgages and things like that, that could become a hardship. I would think in an ideal world, if this were to pass, and that was the will of the board, that around that time, it would have to be done in this fiscal year, but timing it in that area so that way it can lessen the hardship for those who may have to go an additional week without a paycheck. Gotcha. Now that's Chris saying that. Again, I haven't spoken to the person who actually, actually has to do it. I don't know what it entails, but I know she's gonna get it and maybe get double because this is gonna be a lot of work. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Does anyone else have anything they would like to say or questions? Okay. Tina, Tina. if I could if just I say something quickly. Um, first, uh, I think anything to support and acknowledge the amazing efforts of all of our staff. Um, and I really like that this is for staff across the board, everybody who makes learning successful in Enfield Public Schools. Um, you all deserve kudos. So um, I would support this. I also support additional ways that we can support our staff. Um, so I talked a little bit about that during my pub, uh, board member comment, um, but I know as part of budget presentation, thinking about how we can continue to show our appreciation for the staff who can show up, do more than they um, are asked to do, um, and continue to, to be there. So I, I support this, and I look for continued ways to acknowledge staff. Thank you. Roll call. Mrs. Acree? Yes. Dr. Kalman? Yes. Mrs. Cushman? Yes. Mr. Hamry? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. Mrs. Pickett? Yes. yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Mr. Ungeyer? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, next item, board committee reports. Oh, curriculum committee? I'm going to go quick. Sorry, I have a little one waking up upstairs. Um, so thank you to Dr. Berrios. We reviewed TAG, the Tifted and Talented and Gifted Program, um, the history, the current implementation. Um, we had great discussion around how we could reimagine TAG. Um, it's going to take some time. We'd like to get input. Um, so we're going to start by gathering input from surrounding districts um, and then move to finding ways that we can gather input from staff, student, and families. Um, so TAG was our agenda item. Um, we did have an item from the table regarding digital citizenship and um, YouTube and iPads that is going to be looked into further. Um, but again, thank you to Dr. Barrios and the staff at JFK regarding TAG, and we look to kind of continue to work um, around that program. 
Thank you. Finance? Uh, the finance. Sorry. You're good. Uh, the Finance and Budget Committee uh, met on April 4th. We reviewed the nutrition report for February. The net profit was $20,146.04. The year to date, the net profit as of February was $531,754.25. We reviewed the performance of the TAG investment uh, that is being managed by Wolf Financial Group. The total value of the TAG investment as of February 28th was $3,316,924.39, which represented a loss of $71,883.07 in February and a loss of $193,558.19 year to date. So we are a little bit concerned about that. That's two months in a row, uh, I believe, that, that we've, been, we've sustained a loss. So at our next meeting, we will be meeting with Wolf Financial to discuss the implications of these losses and what, if anything, needs to be done to address them. That's it. Thank you. Policy? Uh, policy committee last met on April 19th, as we discussed. Next meeting is May 17th. Uh, we were presented with additional uh, materials and updates from recent legislation changes that we were all looking over and we'll discuss when we meet next um, May 17th. Leadership committee, I'd like to speak to that for a moment. Um, I would like leadership to get together um, to discuss you know, a process on creating committees on going forward and what we feel is the best way. I think that's a priority um, that the leadership needs to take on setting up a process for that. Um, and then I also think that we might have to have a discussion about um, public communications. Um, we cannot have public comments that are gonna be disruptive to our business. Um, tonight has been a long night. We have a lot to cover. So um, I would like to set up a leadership committee meeting. Um, I will look at the date and I will make sure the four of us are available. So if there's something else you would like on that agenda, please, we will talk about that. Um, Mr. Ongai, are you going to speak to joint facilities? No, you know what, since I, in consideration of the time. Yep, that's fine. Joint off. facilities <laughs> met. <laughs> and we're moving along. Joint facilities did meet and we're meeting again on May 12th. Um, the JFK Building Committee. Uh, they last met on April 7th. Um, I had a school event with my son on that evening, and the minutes are not approved yet, so I have not reviewed those. Jonathan, were you able to make that one? No, it's not in attendance, okay. no. All right, so they last met April 7th, and they'll meet again shortly. Joint Insurance Committee, or sorry, Joint Security Committee? Again, we're not meeting till June 1st. Okay. Um, the Joint Insurance Committee is meeting, is it May 12th, I believe, um, in the afternoon? I have to double check the Date. But Gene, if you want to chat before the meeting so I can kind of give you an overview, um, I'd love to you know catch up to speed on that. Yeah, perfect. We'll set up a time for that. Um, also, um, we have some exciting news regarding the Youth Mental Health um, and Wellness Advisory Committee. Um, I'm going to defer to Dr. Kalnan uh, regarding some exciting changes we're having in the town of Enfield. Uh, thanks, Tina. So uh, as I had reported uh, uh, at the last board meeting, the Board of Education planned to resurrect the now defunct Enfield Mental Health and Wellness Council. However, since the Enfield Department of Social Services had already committed to undertaking a mental health initiative involving Enfield citizens of all ages, we felt that it made no sense to duplicate this undertaking. It would have been redundant. So the Board of Education will therefore join the Department of Social Services Enfield Mental Health and Wellness Work Group to advocate for the interests of Enfield children and adolescents. So Jean Acri and I uh, will serve as board representatives. Uh, the first meeting was held on April 5th to review the results of a survey done by B. Wetland Smith Consulting. This survey provided a profile by which to prioritize interventions going forward. So I just wanted to highlight a few, and I won't go through it all because it would, we'd be here all night. Um, just a few of the most salient findings of this study. Briefly, rates of thoughts about and actual attempts at self-harm and suicide are alarmingly high. 
as are the incidences of anxiety and depression. These problems occur most frequently among high school students, but also occur not infrequently in the sixth through the eighth grade cohort. Substance abuse among all children from sixth to 12th grade most commonly involves in order of frequency alcohol, around 8% of this population, followed closely by marijuana, e-cigarettes, and regular cigarettes. Prescription drug and heroin abuse uh, occurs in 2.4% and 1.5% of this population, respectively. The good news is that abuse, substance abuse involving uh, all of these substances has been trending downward since 2013. This study also focused on the impact of COVID on the mental health of Enfield residents. As expected, COVID has indeed had a significant adverse impact on childhood mental health, with a 54% rise in the incidence of anxiety, a 48% rise in depression, and a 46% rise in feelings of loneliness since the onset of the epidemic. The study notes that generally speaking, there's a correlation between the prevalence of mental health disorders and socioeconomic status. Uh, Enfield has been designated a community with a high social vulnerability index, which is a measure of socioeconomic challenges. And this suggests a need to address social determinants of health as an important component of our mental health plan. And one reason, why Kite's 2Gen project is so timely. So I just wanted to throw in another pitch for 2Gen. Um, the work group will be meeting again on May 3rd to discuss the ramifications of these findings and to begin mapping out a community-wide plan to deal with them. I think the only uh, area of uh, a, a bit of a gap uh, in the research done so far is there was no attention paid to... Uh, uh, children five years of age and younger. Um, and uh, so that was brought up. And we have to find some sort of a way of addressing that because as we, as we discussed earlier tonight, uh, mental health at that age really dictates to a large extent what happens further down the road, not only in terms of mental health, but um, educational attainment and even physical health. So it's an issue that urgently needs to be addressed. That's it. Uh, just for clarification, if you do have an answer to this, do they, I don't want to say meet regularly, but it, is there a um, date set? Like, I know one of the, when you were discussing with Gene about the formation, um, you wanted to meet on a more regular basis with this committee before what you presented tonight, so. Yeah, we have another meeting, uh, May 3rd, I think it is, Gene. That's the only thing that we've decided at this point. I think at the May 3rd meeting, We'll decide, you know, how do we want to further structure the work group and what schedule we want to put in place. Um, should we be changing the name of it then on our agenda? We have Youth Mental Health and Wellness Advisory Committee. Should it be changed to something else? Uh, the formal name for this is the Enfield Mental Health and Wellness Work Group. Okay. We can add that to the agenda, Kathy, next time. Um, and then from what I'm understanding, and I believe Jean and Dr. Jerry are understanding it's evolving into something different to be more of a community-wide type of initiative where the, you have your focus on the youth, you have your focuses in all different places, and then you all work together. So, okay, great. Thank you. Um, there's no other committee reports. Um, item 13, approval of the minutes, regular Board of Ed meeting minutes, March 22nd, 2022. So moved. Second. Show of hands. Thanks. <laughs> Approval of accounts and payroll for the month of March 2022, Dr. Kalman. Um, so the certification of expenditures, the finance committee met on April 4th, 2022 to review financial statements for the month of March year to date and to examine various documents related to finances. Our review concluded that there is nothing significant to report to the board. So the motion is, I move we accept the superintendent's certification as follows, quote, I hereby certify that in the month of March, total expenditures amount to $6,550,466.33, broken down between payroll totaling 
$4,583,306.24, and other accounts totaling $1,967,160.09. I'm sorry, $1,967,160.09. All payments have been made in accordance with the approved budget and are properly accounted for within the books of accounts. Copies of approval for check invoices are properly documented. Second. Okay. No, we have to make it. We have to vote on second. that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, second by Mr. Hamry. Show of hands. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Kelly. Okay, certification of grants and Head Start expenditures. Uh, the Finance Committee met on April 4th, 2022 to review financial statements for grants during the month of March, year to date, and to examine various documents related to finances. Our review concluded that there is nothing significant to report to the board. The motion, I move we accept the superintendent's certification as follows. I hereby certify that in the month of March, the total grant and Head Start expenditures amounted to $521,827.74, broken down between payroll totaling $447,300 and $13.74, and other accounts totaling $74,514. All payments have been made in accordance with the approved budget and are properly accounted for within the books of accounts. Copies of approval for check invoices are properly documented. Seconded by Mr. Ryder, show of hands. Any correspondence and communications? Mm -hmm. Motion to move into executive session. So moved. Second. Um, Mr. Hamry, second by Mr. Ryder. Show of hands. Thank you. We won't be coming back. <laughs>